Hey everyone, welcome to the third and final day of A Future Date. A Future Date is a volunteer-led, free, virtual accessibility conference with the goal of providing a platform to host some of the sessions that have been canceled in the past few months due to COVID. My name is Lanya Butler, and I'm one of the volunteer organizers for this virtual conference. I wanted to start out by thanking all of the volunteers who have helped to organize this event, our speakers for sharing their wisdom, 3Play Media for providing captions for this event, and Basecamp for providing their project management tool. We have a really great program today of sessions in our Accessible Programs track. Most of our speakers will be available to answer questions throughout their sessions in the Q&A live chat box. Please remember to sign into your YouTube account if you want to ask a question or participate in the chat. Please remember to adhere to our code of conduct, which I will read now. <coughs> Be respectful to the speakers and other participants in the live chat. If a participant is disrupting the event or causing problems with other users, our moderators may take any corrective action they see fit. We will issue one warning maximum to a participant before banning them from the chat and comments for the duration of the event. We will ban participants without warning for actions that are harmful to others, either individually or collectively. This includes harassment of any kind. Our sessions are pre-recorded and the chat is the only interactive component for this conference. Please address any urgent concerns to afuturedate.conference at gmail.com. Again, that's afuturedate.conference at gmail.com which we will monitor in real time. My coworker and I will be kicking off the day with our talk, No Team, No Problem, Implementing Accessibility with No Dedicated Resources. This will be followed by our keynote at noon Eastern time, Why Add People with Disabilities to Your Workforce, presented by Lucy Greco, Lainey Feingold, and Ted Drake. At 1 p.m. Eastern time, we will be switching streams to present the Digital Accessibility Legal Summit. This will be presented live. You will be able to find information on how to access it on our stream and on our website. At 2.40 Eastern Time, I hope you'll join us for Beyond Standards, a holistic approach to accessibility, followed by Building an Accessible Culture in Higher Ed. And our final talk of the day will be how to engage and employ users from the disability community in accessibility testing. Individual talks will be posted on the Future Date YouTube channel and links to available videos and slide decks will be shared on our website after the event has ended. I hope you enjoy the day. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us virtually. Um, we're really excited to present this session, which was supposed to be at CSUN this year, but we're really thrilled to have an opportunity to do it virtually since we weren't able to be there this year. We hope everyone is staying safe and well. Our presentation is called No Team, No Resources, No Problem, and we're with 3Play Media, and you can follow us on Twitter at 3Play Media. Um, we also want to mention that we welcome feedback and thoughts on the presentation and you can feel free to reach out to us with any feedback you have. To introduce ourselves, I'm Lily Bond. Um, I'm the Senior Director of Marketing at 3Play Media. I run our marketing team and strategy and uh, I'm really passionate about accessibility, which is why I'm here. A fun fact about me is that I studied classical voice in college and was almost an opera singer. but. Luckily, I wasn't, and here I am. My name is Lanya Butler. Um, I'm a senior full stack engineer at 3Play, and I spend a lot of my day writing code. Like Lily, I am passionate about accessibility, and for fun, I am a circus performer. Throughout this presentation, we'll be using A11Y as an acronym for accessibility. Uh, this is symbolic for the importance of being an ally to the disability community. And there are also 11 letters between the A and Y in accessibility. 
So to give you a little bit of background, which I think is helpful as we dive into this presentation, it's important to understand kind of where we're coming from being a part of 3Play Media. 3Play Media is a closed captioning, audio description, and translation company. So we work directly with video accessibility. And I think an important caveat here is that we are an accessibility company. So we already had awareness and understanding of the importance of accessibility within, within our company. And I think that you know, made it a little bit easier for us to make this happen, this being you know, a more accessible company. Um, but it's kind of an uphill battle for everyone, regardless of, of how your company feels about accessibility. So we're really going to cover some, some helpful tips that we've found um, to build accessibility into 3Play without a team or without any dedicated resources. Um, so to kind of kick us off, I want to explain why we're doing this presentation. Last year at this time, um, or not exactly at this time anymore, we, Lanya and I, were at CSUN. It was my fifth CSUN and Lanya's first CSUN. And we went to a presentation together by Oracle on building accessibility into the development process. And we kind of had an aha moment, like, that this is something that we could do at 3Play too, and that this was something that if we kind of put our minds together, we might be able to implement and create a more centralized approach to accessibility at 3Play, um, and we were really excited about kicking that off. And I, I also just want to note, like, it was my fifth time, like I said, and it was Lanya's first time, and one thing that really still stands out to me that Lanya said was, they, uh, they really went into CSUN thinking that everyone knew what they were doing and that the conference would be a series of presentations telling them how to make accessibility happen at our company. Um, but, but they found it super refreshing to learn that it's more about figuring it out together and that everyone's in this together trying to figure it out. So um, I think that's really what our presentation is about. This is kind of how we've figured some things out. And again, we're welcoming feedback and um, we're still figuring it out. So I hope you'll take this with a grain of salt, but we're kind of uh, using this as a starting point to, to do more. And uh, I think it's also important to note that sometimes progress is really slow. So prior to 2019, this is kind of what accessibility looked like at 3Play. And we have four markers on the screen with dates. Um, so the first marker is pre-2015. When I started at 3Play, pretty much the only thing we were doing as a company for accessibility was PDF remediation. So we were remediating all of our white papers and also making all of our public facing marketing content accessible. So we were using HTML best practices in our blog, um, you know, making sure we had color contrast and alt text, but basically uh, some of the basics around web accessibility. And there was a lot more that we could do. In 2016, which is our second date marker, we started getting more involved with the accessibility community. And I think this was a real jumping off point for us because it made us feel much, much closer to the people that our service serves. Um, so we started a project called Faces Behind the Screen, which is a series of interviews with people um, in the deaf and hard of hearing community, as well as the blind and low vision community really learning about their experiences with technology and um, their lives in general. And that uh, really brought accessibility to the forefront of people's minds at 3Play. 2017 is the third marker here. Uh, it's titled Marketing. Um, what that means is we did a full public site redesign in 2017 of our marketing website, 3playmedia.com, really focused on making our full website accessible. And then in 2018, um, I, you know, I took something back from CSUN that year too, and that was about um, building accessibility into the onboarding process so that people learn accessibility right away. Um, so we implemented an accessibility in onboarding in 2018, and that's going to be some, something that we really kind of dive into later about how to make that happen. So as Lily, Lily said, in 2019, we attended CSUN together, and... Uh, felt moved to make accessibility more of a central goal for our company for the year. Um, so we set some goals for ourselves, including uh, creating a accessibility committee, which we call Free Plally, um, creating an internal accessibility guideline sheet, um, which we based off of WCAG 2.1, 
um, so that our company could understand the guidelines in more bite-sized chunks um, and so they could interact with them slightly easier. Uh, we had an annual goal of rewriting our account system to improve the user experience uh, and code maintainability, and we made sure to build accessibility into those plans and goals. So looking back at our year, we're really excited about the amount of growth uh, we've had in shaping the company culture and processes, and we have five tips with, to share with you from what we've learned. Our first tip is to make it shared. Um, making accessibility a shared responsibility is the best advice that we can give. Some ways we've done this include creating a committee so that the responsibility doesn't rest on one person, dividing and conquering tasks, and making individual people subject matter experts so that they can be a point person. So when you don't have a dedicated accessibility resource, you need to spread out responsibility and knowledge. Um, everyone in our company has a regular day job responsibility. And if you try to take on accessibility alone, it can be extremely overwhelming and it's just way too much work. So we decided to create a committee, um, which we call Free Plowly. In choosing the committee, we considered the following factors, mainly passion and diversity. Um, again, because this would be outside of someone's standard job description, we needed to, for it to be volunteer. So we looked for people who would get really excited about accessibility um, and would go an extra mile with us. When you see someone who's really passionate, it's easy for that passion to spread to other people. We also knew that accessibility covers a lot of ground, um, from the way we hire to the way you design or build software. So we wanted the members of the Three Plally Committee to reflect the whole range of departments that we have at Three Play. Adding diversity to the committee adds a variety of strengths and perspectives. Finally, uh, you can't learn accessibility best practices overnight. Um, so when picking people we thought would be good candidates for Three Plally, we thought about shaping the committee into groups of people where individuals could be subject matter experts in areas that complemented their standard jobs. Um, this way, when people in the company have questions, we have one person to point them to. This also gives the person who's learning about accessibility a small bite-sized chunk to start with. Here's a layout of some of our three Plally committee. This is about six in 15 people that we have on the committee now. Um, as an example, I am a senior developer and I was the technical lead on our account system redesign. So it made a lot of sense for me to be the expert on code uh, design best practices as well as our VPAT. Um, as a designer, Derek needed to build accessibility standards straight into our designs. Um, so he's our expert on usability and accessibility for that. And as our customer product manager, who leads a lot of our QA testing, Hug was central to building out a process um, that includes accessibility. Through Plally ended up with a lot of people, about 14 uh, out of our 55 people, which ends up being a quarter of our company. However, we end up creating a lot of subcommittees for specific tasks in order to get stuff done. For example, we created a guidelines committee to write a set of internal guidelines based off of WCAG, and we pulled a diverse set of members from through Palai who had knowledge about marketing, UX, legal, or development. We found that even with our small group of five, it was sometimes hard to make decisions on the best way to move forward. So I recommend always having one decision maker for all of your committees. Another example is our Global Accessibility Awareness Day Planning Committee. That was made up of four people across marketing, development, and HR. Various departments at 3Play have their own subcultures, and having a diverse set of members in our planning committee has helped to create events that keep people engaged with accessibility events. 
Our second tip is to make it, make it universal. Um, so making accessibility a priority from the beginning with everyone at the company has been really key in getting company-wide awareness early. A few ways that we do that are through onboarding, which I mentioned. So um, this has been kind of one of the biggest wins we've had as a company is building accessibility into our onboarding process as a full section that every employee goes through the beginning of their time at 3Play so that we educate employees early on accessibility and it becomes a part of their awareness of everything they do. The second thing we've done is we've created an A11Y Slack channel to let everyone in the company be an advocate in their own way by sharing articles, um, sharing tips, and sharing stories. And then um, we also have found that it's really important um, as a company to give back. So committing to annual charitable donations um, in the accessibility world can be a great way to get your company involved um, with accessibility. Making accessibility a part of onboarding. So these are some, some tips that we've learned from building accessibility into our onboarding per process. Um, and just as an overview, as, as a company, we have kind of a, a, a course-based onboarding process where every department has a course that new employees go through to learn the basics of what each department does and all of kind of the relevant information that they should know in their role. And in addition to every department, we now have an accessibility course. Um, and we also have an accessibility presentation on everyone's first day at the company, which I provide um, and I train every single person in kind of the basics of awareness around accessibility because a lot of people come in not necessarily knowing those basics. So the first tip here is build it first. Um, don't just ask to make an accessibility onboarding section, build it. Having something to show helps with buy-in. So when I kind of came out of CSUN with this idea like, oh my gosh, we should build accessibility into onboarding, um, I knew that if I asked for permission to do that, um, people would be concerned about the time commitment, um, about uh, kind of the process there. But it took me probably half an hour to put together the basics of an onboarding section with some ideas of questions we could ask, quizzes we could give people, and resources that we could provide. And once I had that grounding, which again, like was not a big time commitment, um, it became really easy to get buy-in because people could see something and said, oh wow, yes, this would be super helpful. And um, you know, as long as it's not a big time commitment, go for it. Um, so, uh, you know, from there I built it out a lot more, but it, having that, that grounding really kind of was key to getting buy-in there. Um, building awareness. Um, so making, uh, making your accessibility onboarding really engaging with hands-on activities um, will open new employees' eyes to accessibility. So um, instead of just asking them, you know, what's the, the proper color contrast ratio, uh, make them try some hex codes and uh, provide you with different color combinations that are accessible and make them kind of ask questions about why or why not something is accessible. Um, kind of one of our hot tips here is to have um, one of the onboarding pieces be using a screen reader. So uh, that's definitely been eye-opening for a lot of employees who may not have even heard of a screen reader in the past when they're getting started with a new company that prioritizes accessibility. And then our third tip here, and this is kind of like critical, this is the piece that's like uh, I can't stress this enough, is make it required. Um, so just uh, requiring every single person in the company to do these things, it doesn't take a ton of time for anyone to have one presentation on the first day and to have them do one course on accessibility means that every person at 3Play has the same baseline knowledge of accessibility and every single person can move forward with, with accessibility in mind for their role. 
using Slack has been a, a really fun way to get people involved with accessibility at 3Play. Our Slack channel is very active with legal updates, assistive technology news, and incredible stories related to accessibility. Um, on the screen, there is a, uh, an iPhone with a view of our Slack channel. And uh, an example of something that Lanya shared uh, in August, um, it's an article, service dogs in training attend a private performance of Billy Elliot to learn proper theater behavior, which is obviously a very delightful update. Um, a few other examples that we share, we've shared recently are the FCC proposes expanding video description mandates, um, two blind brothers uh, with a shop blind campaign, and Rebecca Alexander describing how to clean your cane, comm pilot, and sunglasses with disinfecting products. On the screen, we also have uh, an image of uh, a chart of our accessibility Slack channel usage. And uh, since January of 2018 through January 2019, uh, there was mixed usage here, but really starting in March, um, Quick note there, that was exactly when Lanya and I attended CSUN last year and had made a commitment to really prioritize accessibility. We've just seen a huge spike in activity across the company, um, which is amazing. And another pro tip here is it's a great way to create a dedicated space for people to ask questions about accessibility. I mean, we get great questions from people across the company here all the time. Uh, I mentioned uh, charitable donations. So we as a company have a couple of times a year where we have a big company event focused on, on charitable donations in the accessibility campaign, in the accessibility community, sorry. Um, my tips here are create a campaign. Um, so on Giving Tuesday every year, we've built a campaign that rallies our employees and customers around submitting files um, and every file submitted, um, for every file submitted, we make a donation to an accessibility charity. Um, and uh, last year we chose the Hearing Loss Association of America, which is a great a uh, great organization, um, but we mix it up every year. And we also make uh, donations uh, on Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Our third tip is to make it fun. We believe that a key to get a company to care about accessibility is to bake it into the culture. You need to engage people and make them care. Some ways we've done this uh, include creating social events that relate to accessibility, holding workshops to encourage empathy, and involving the whole company in opportunities to learn from the disability community. For Global Accessibility Awareness Day last year, our GAD committee planned a team bonding event to build wheelchairs. Um, the entire company participated from all of our like new hires all the way through to our co-founders. Uh, we've also participated in the Walk for Hearing. Uh, we've held empathy workshops with workshops like using screen readers or learning short phrases in ASL. We acknowledge that empathy workshops are divisive. But at 3Play, we found that they were extremely helpful to bring awareness around necessary accommodations that people had no previous exposure to or awareness of. We've also worked to engage the office with a variety of storytelling projects through the year. Uh, Lily mentioned Faces Behind the Screen. It is a project that was inspired by Humans of New York. And through photographs and interviews, it aims to be a platform to for people with disabilities to share their stories and perspectives um, so through this project we're hoping to bring more awareness to the importance of web accessibility this was a project that our marketing team started in 2017 uh, but more recently we've expanded the project so that everyone from any department uh, can is encouraged to get involved we've recently had members of our support team and hr teams write stories we also had social media campaigns, sign your thanks and sign your love um, around Valentine's Day and Thanksgiving Day. And we encouraged people to learn short phrases in ASL uh, that expressed what they were thankful for or loved. 
um, the whole office filmed these phrases and posted them on social media, and we had great office participation. The next tip is to make it usable. Um, don't scare your team away with massive checklists. We've found that employees' eyes kind of gloss over when we send them a WCAG checklist, and so making um, accessibility guidelines engaging uh, has been a big challenge and something we've put a lot of effort into. A few ways that we've done this are with context clues. So instead of giving them a checklist and expecting them to use it, we give them scenarios and expect them to apply guidelines to scenarios that are, are relevant to them. Um, by making it relevant and separating guidelines by what will be applicable to their department and their job roles and their everyday life, um, we've been able to, to avoid kind of information overload um, by only pointing people to what they really need to know. And then uh, humanizing these guidelines. So building empathy by adding user stories to each guideline um, has been another way that we've tried to um, get people excited about, about using these guidelines because they care about the impact that they can have. So in terms of applying guidelines to scenarios they know, we really take examples of uh, everyday activities that each department does and apply guidelines that, that may be relevant to them. For example, with a sales rep, they might be writing an email. In fact, they write dozens of emails every day. Um, but what guidelines and best practices are important for them to know and why? How can they um, add alt text to any images in their email signature? Um, what language should they use so that they, if they don't know who they're talking to, they don't offend any potential um, people with disabilities? On the marketing team, um, if you're writing a blog, uh, who could interact with that blog and what guidelines should they follow to support that use case, um, making sure that, they, that the marketing team knows all of the best practices for you know, heading structure in a blog and um, all the ways to make a table accessible or to make an image accessible. And then on the support team, uh, if a support rep gets a ticket with an accessibility complaint, they're kind of the front lines of the company. Um, so really making sure that they, they know how they should respond and what's important for them to know in that response um, so that they don't kind of get a, get a ticket, respond negatively, and create a, a, a poor experience for someone with disabilities. Segmenting training for employees has been huge. So not only segmenting the guidelines, but segmenting the training. So we've tagged every guideline um, that we built in our, um, in our accessibility guidelines, I guess taking a step back, our legal sub subcommittee um, translated WCAG into a set of guidelines for three play to use internally on all of our, uh, all of our content, um, both public facing and internal. Um, and segmenting those guidelines uh, by, with tags for departments um, so that different teams can view a kind of a subset of guidelines that are relevant to them. And then similarly segmenting training so that we don't overwhelm employees with information that they might not need on a daily basis. Um, so we've developed team specific trainings to cover what's important to the people that we're talking to. And finally, um, or not finally, sorry, um, making it human um, is, is really key at 3Play. So understanding why something is important um, and tying the requirements back to real users and stories uh, really builds a, a connection with why we should be doing things. So um, on the screen, you can see there's an iPad um, with a guideline around color contrast. Um, it says never rely solely on color to distinguish information. And then side by side with that is uh, a story from Faces Behind the Screen, read Brian and Brad's st story. Um, these, are, these are people um, that are directly affected by, by not using um, the guidelines that are relevant here. Tip five is to make it sustainable. So we believe that shaping a company into one that cares about accessibility requires uh, process changes in addition to culture changes. 
Maintaining accessibility is a constant challenge. You can't just update your code once and call it done. Um, you need processes and systems in place so that future employees learn about accessibility from the day they start and it continues to permeate through the company in the future. For us, this has involved departmental training, spreading out knowledge, and holding ourselves accountable. Where are we now? Um, so in 2019, we built a lot of momentum in terms of company culture and awareness. Um, at this point, a quarter of our company is part of the Three Play Accessibility Committee. Um, and using the Three Play Ally guidelines, we've built and launched accessibility updates to our account system. Uh, the internal, the, excuse me, the entire Three Play Ally Committee gave a presentation about the state of accessibility at Three Play. Um, where everyone in the committee researched a best practice to share with the rest of the company. And we're continuing to look forward to upcoming challenges like how to sustain this and how to keep ourselves accountable. Uh, we have no plans to make this a full-time job position and acknowledge that working on this project outside of our standard job responsibilities is difficult. Uh, in 2020, some of our goals include finishing the account system redesign and updating our VPAT, um, creating more structure around annual goals around accessibility and check-ins for ourselves. Um, we also are going to keep planning culture and social events uh, that care about accessibility. Um, for example, our GAD team has added a new member from the implementation team and it, we're working hard to plan a remote event for next month. Um, I have some final hot tips to share. The first one is don't get buy-in, just do it. It can be really tempting to ask for permission for every initiative that you're starting. Um, and I think this tip is definitely dependent on company culture, but at our small 50 person company, we've found that act first and ask for forgiveness later is the fastest way to make progress. Obviously you need to use some common sense, um, but we've had a lot of success in doing the work first and then making a case for why these changes are important and relevant to our company. Don't discount the impact of small initiatives. Um, Lily talked earlier about how she added uh, accessibility training to our onboarding. Um, I have made accessibility part of my personal annual goal for the year to make sure that I keep working on this and the whole development team continues to make progress. Um, I added accessibility concerns as a section to our internal bugs and features tracking system at 3Play. Um, one accessibility Slack channel doesn't change a company overnight, but combined with storytelling projects and small process changes over time, you can build up a signal that accessibility is something that matters to your whole company. The second hot tip is to get good at volunteering. A skill that I've picked up from this experience is volunteering people for positions. So it's great to ask for volunteers, but what do you do if you hear crickets on the other side? You can point to a few specific people and engage and encourage them. It's a lot harder to say no when someone's saying, hey Ryan, I think that this would be a great project for you to get involved in. You can slowly get people involved with the broader initiative by asking them for help for small specific tasks. Um, asking someone to co-chair a whole accessibility committee and changing the entire com uh, company culture can be really daunting. But what if you just ask for help in planning a small task, like a one hour lunch and learn for Global Accessibility Awareness Day. On a final note, we want to acknowledge that we're not perfect as an accessibility team or a company, but we're moving in a positive direction and we care a lot. Um, we've learned that it's okay for changes to be small and that together they can make a big difference and um, you know, I think just in the last year, we've seen so much momentum and progress at 3Play that we're hoping that some of the, the lessons we've learned in that experience have been helpful for you and that you can take some of these and apply even little tips um, from this presentation to make accessibility uh, a broader initiative at your company.
So thank you so much for joining us. Um, we uh, would love to answer any questions. Again, love feedback. We both uh, care a lot about accessibility and have really been involved in pushing this forward at 3Play and would love to learn about what you're doing that's working so we can, can take that uh, back to our company as well. Um, and just in general, love to connect with other people in the community. So feel free to reach out to us. Um, my email is lily at 3playmedia.com and Lanya's is lanya at 3playmedia.com. Thank you so much, everyone.
Hello, everybody, and welcome to the keynote session about hiring people with disabilities. I'm Lucy Greco, and I am the Accessibility Evangelist for UC Berkeley, and I lead the University of California's Accessibility Initiative. Today, I am joined by Lainey Feingold. Please introduce yourself. Thanks, Lucy. I'm Lainey Feingold. I'm a disability rights lawyer, and I've been working in the digital accessibility space since 1995. And I've written a book about how to use collaboration to help advance accessibility. And Ted Drake. Uh, I'm Ted Drake, and uh, I'm the global accessibility leader at Intuit. Uh, before that, I was with the Accessibility Lab at Yahoo, and I've been a developer evangelist and accessibility uh, advocate for probably 20 years now. Um, I started in the museum world. Excellent. So I brought two of my closest friends together for this presentation because we all work on different sides of the accessibility world. Lainey, of course, is on the legal side. Ted is a developer and myself, I am a tester as well as an evangelist and promoter of accessibility. So I wanted to start by asking if the two of you had any really great stories about working with people with disabilities. Uh, Lainey, why don't you start? Uh, it was very hard to think of just one great story because <laughs> I've been very lucky in my legal career to practice law and collaboration so that people with disabilities are involved in all the advocacy efforts I've done. So I thought I would share two, even though yes for one, that's okay. Um, and the first is the very first one. So I got involved in this space um, back in the 90s when we were working on ATMs that would talk for blind people. And we worked along with the California Council of the Blind, the American Council, a lot of blind individuals. We went to the major banks. We said, you have a problem here. ATMs can't be used by blind people. That's a security problem, a privacy problem. Um, but rather than sue, let's sit down and talk about it. And as part of those conversations, we were able to introduce blind people to the ATM developers. And it was like, literally, you could see the light bulbs go off. And that is what cemented my commitment to working in collaboration. Because in traditional litigation, there's not a lot of opportunities for companies to get to know blind people or any people who are disabled as people. Instead, they're plaintiffs. So I just have very clear memories all over the country. Um, in Boston, Kim Charlson was uh, showing what it was like to be a professional person. You can't get your own $20 out of a machine. And the bank guy wrote me afterwards like, oh my God, I never knew. You know, so it was just an amazing experience. So we've gone on and done that many times on websites too. We introduced Major League Baseball to blind baseball fans. It was like a match in heaven. So I've had a lot of great experiences with it and it's been crucial to my way of being a lawyer. All right, Ted, so how about you? What kind of stories do you have for us? I was thinking about uh, stories because there's so many examples, as Lainey said, where you've worked with people and they've made small or large changes and impacted the way products were developed. But there is one story. When I was at Yahoo, um, the Yahoo Maps team came to the Accessibility Lab and they wondered how they can make Yahoo Maps accessible. And if that was just coming from the viewpoint of someone that uh, did not have a disability, we would have looked at things like headings image alt text. We would have looked at form labels, basically thinking, well, how do we make it accessible? But in that meeting was Victor Sarin, who is blind and uses a screen reader. And so we had a really good conversation about what does maps actually represent? What does a person that uses a screen reader or someone that blind, how do they use maps? And what that conversation led to was the redesigning of Yahoo Maps to focus on directions. Um, because the, the map itself was just a collection of images that had no substantive value. Uh, visually, they represented streets, but at the time they had no way of representing the street names. 
So what they did was they redesigned maps and they focused on how can people get directions as fast as possible. Um, now that simple interview with uh, Victor wasn't just about making it available for him. How did he know what the, the screen looked like, but rather change the experience for all Yahoo map users. That's fantastic. So it generally, from what both of you are saying, is it, it, it opens up developers' eyes to what the needs of people with disabilities are and how people with disabilities work on projects. Uh, it, it's really critical to remember when we're working in the world of accessibility and in the, you know, in the field of, say, the web or creating new products, be them, you know, an, an appliance, a website, an application of some sort, that a large minor, majority of the world does not actually know a person with a disability. I mean, there are millions of people with disabilities out there in the world, but most people don't have their sphere of influence with a person with a disability. So it's really, really critical to understand that, you know, people with disabilities are out there and what their unique needs are. And those unique needs can actually improve our products. Um, I want to go back to both of you again and ask, Ted, Talk about what a person's reaction is when they first meet a person with a disability and how, the, how, they've, um, how they've reacted to at that person with a disability and if it's changed them in any way. This is individuals now. Yeah, and I think, I think the question is really focusing on visible disabilities versus uh, hidden disabilities. I think when someone first meets a person with a visible disability. For instance, they're in a wheelchair or they use a, a guide dog, or for some reason, it's pretty obvious that the person uses assistive technology or has a disability. And so the reaction they get from that is different from someone they meet, maybe someone that they've known for decades and just found out that that person has a hidden disability. Um, so the person with meeting someone with a, with a visible disability, it's almost like um, they can they can understand the situation. They start thinking of how they're going to get around the technicalities of the meeting. How are they going to work with this or that? And they're you know the the processes are going through their mind. I think a lot of times when people meet someone with a hidden disability, um, they don't know what to. They don't have that kind of preparedness, um, and so there might be more curiosity. Uh, not understanding how the hidden disability actually affects someone. Um, the other thing is I might also say someone with a communication disability, whether that's someone using a assistive communication device like Prello Code Go or something, or someone that's uh, deaf and uses American Sign Language. A lot of times it's, what's the protocol? Like, how do I communicate with this person? So I, I I think the average person that doesn't know someone is not familiar with uh, people with disabilities on a daily basis. I think those might be some of the questions that go through their mind. Excellent. And Lainey, how about you? What have you, what have you found people's reactions have been? Um, well, listening to your question and listening to Ted, I think sort of a key word here is assumptions. Yeah. I think people have assumptions about really everyone and everything in the universe, but especially so about disabled people and their capabilities and how they use technology, what we're talking about specifically. I have a great quote in my book from Isaac Asimov that's, uh, your assumptions are your windows on the world. You know, clean them off every now and then to make sure you're, you're seeing what needs to be seen. So, one example of that from my work, and again, over and over, because I think people layer onto disabled people lots of stuff that has nothing to do with them. Like you see someone blind, like just in everyday language, you know, the blind leading the blind is supposed to be some ridiculous thing. Well, in fact, I know from my experience that a lot of blind people have a hell of a better sense of direction than I do. And I have definitely been you know, the beneficiary of blind people with a good sense of direction when I myself can't know whether to go left or right out of a hotel room 
you know, hotel entry. So we did a negotiation with Charles Schwab on behalf of a blind investor, Kit Lau, who lives in the Bay Area. And she's a power options user. Trading options, a very challenging thing, whether you're sighted or not sighted. And Kit is super fast at it. She uses a braille display and she uses talking software, screen reader. And, you know, because of structured negotiation, we were able to have a meeting with the developers of Charles Schwab and Kit. We had a big screen set up and she was showing them like, here's how I do it. Here's where the barriers are. And it's like everybody's and they, you know, the company was great to work with. They really wanted to get it right because we didn't create any fear and negativity from the outset. And so she was showing them and you could just see the developers, they had never even contemplated that someone would be doing this very hard and challenging task without any sight, just listening to what they did. So, you know, it was, then they said, oh, can we bring our trainers in here? You know, it was just like one of these just great meetings of learning and sharing. And Kit got to some button and she's like, like, see, you didn't label this. So it just says button. So I don't know what it is. And, and some guy in the room said, well, we should label it and we will label it, but it's the help button. And clearly you don't need that much help. It was just like, it was a great moment. So yeah, I think assumptions, you know, from every sense, from designing who's using your products and developing them, how are they using the products? We had another thing with the uh, post office kiosks and I was down at the Berkeley post office, I'll never forget this, with Paul Schrader very, you know, probably 10, 15 years ago, we could not for the life of us find the audio jack. We knew they had done all this work to make those kiosks, which I don't even know if they have anymore, um, interactive and they were using easy access that Greg Vanderheiden had at the time, but we couldn't find where to plug in the, mm -hmm. the plug. And I couldn't see it. And Paul was feeling for the plug. And finally, Paul felt it before I saw it. I never would have seen it. And it was just talk about universal design, that plug, the earphone jack, when I say plug, the earphone jack was in the wrong place for everybody. So the assumption of not being able to learn from disabled people and, oh, there's not enough disabled people, do we really have to do it when the innovation that comes from building accessibility benefits everybody? Oh, can, I, can I add to that real quick? Um, assumptions is critical. And so at Intuit, we have an accessibility champion program. And we start that by showing a really good video of disability etiquette from the Department of Labor in Washington, DC, because we want to immediately break down those assumptions. And then as people become accessibility champions, they further in that, where they have two requirements, two tasks to assist in that. One is that they have to do a go home. They have to follow me home where they, where they uh, meet someone that has a disability and watch them do something like file their taxes or create an invoice so that they can understand how people use software um, or complete a task in a real life situation. And we also ask them to volunteer with a nonprofit organization that helps people with disabilities because we want people to become I don't want to say comfortable, but I just, you, you've, got to, you've got to be around a diverse group of people in order to understand the needs of a diverse uh, community. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very, very much, Ted. This is exactly the, the point and the goal of this particular um, talk that I brought up, that, why I brought you here is because these are the really key things that I want people to realize. If we don't interact with people with disabilities on a daily basis, and it doesn't have to be every single day, but it needs to be as part of normal life. Something needs to happen that makes the person with a disability a person first. I mean, we've been talking for a really long time about person first language, but when we come to assistive technology and working on access, we forget sometimes that the person is first and we, we focus on the standards and the rules and, you know, what good HTML is and all the rest. And we forget that real people are behind these. And as soon as we bring real people back into the project, we actually get not only accessible products, but products that work for everyone. Um, 
I think, Ted, you were over here once doing one of these go homes. Mm -hmm. You actually got my husband to, to sit down and <laughs> show something he was having a problem with to the development team that was there. And they're like, we never even thought a person would want to do that. And it turns out a lot of people want to do that. <laughs> He's not an unusual person. And it's really key for people to understand that, first of all, people with disabilities are people. And they have ways of doing things that are different, but might be more effective for everyone. Lucy, I think um, this is a good place I totally agree with what you just said. And it's a good place to just remember about diversity and inclusion programs for employment have to include disabled people. Mm -hmm. And hiring disabled people is really an element of building your accessibility program. Um, I did a talk with Microsoft at CSUN a couple of years ago, and we were saying like, how do you build accessibility culture? And you know, there were all these issues, like you said, design and development and training and testing. And I, have, you know, I always knew, of course, you want to have diverse hiring. It's a place where the ADA has fallen short. But it wasn't until I heard Microsoft, which has such a leadership role in this space right now, say, well, yeah, inclusive hiring is part of accessibility culture. Because if the person in the next cubicle can't hear, it's a lot less likely that you're going to put out a video program that doesn't allow for high quality captions, for example. So, you know, hiring is really a key aspect of this, hiring disabled people. And not only in the roles of testers, for example, you've got to hire disabled people so that they're part of the culture and just part of the community. Um, you know, I have a very dear friend of mine who is a developer at Google, not on the accessibility team, but working on just one of the teams within Google. And he has changed the culture of that team immensely to the point where when, they first, when he first joined the team, they would start sending screenshots out to show people issues. And he would just, you know, gently prod them saying, you know, I, I don't see the screenshot. Can you describe it? And now his whole team, by default, even when they're not communicating with him, are describing their screenshots and are thinking about alt text for images and buttons and so forth in a much more effective way. They, they've improved their entire way of thinking about what happens with an image, who's seeing that image and how that image is processed for everyone. And, you know, he's just another developer on the team. I think, in fact, you know, as a totally blind person, he's not working on accessibility as his first project. That's just his side project. He's actually working on network optimization. And that's, that's critical because people can't think of us as the token blind people or the token person who's deaf or hard of hearing. They have to realize that we are just another person doing our job who needs slightly different ways of doing our job. Do you have any examples of how that has affected people at Intuit, Ted? Well, there's, there's a, a catch-22 here. Um, one thing is that we wouldn't go to Grace Hopper, which is a conference for women engineers, with a team of all men and try to uh, recruit women engineers to join us by having all men show up. But that's what we're doing when we go to disability conferences and such with all able-bodied non-disabled people trying to recruit. Um, so we do have to be representative. The other thing though is that because of privacy, um, I don't know who has disability at Intuit unless they come forward to me. So it's hard for me to say, well, here's a person that um, has cerebral palsy and I want them to go to this meeting. Unless that person comes to me, I don't know. So part of what's important is that companies create employee networks. And those employee networks not only provide support for individuals and their family members, but also gives a community um, where uh, let's say someone joins the company and uh, they have a child with all, uh, autism, they can connect with other parents of children with autism. We have a, um, a person that just started one of our local networks and she's been, uh, she's been sharing her uh, sobriety 
and she's been leading the uh, breaking down the stigma of uh, addiction and sobriety in the workplace. These are things that an employee network provides the, the platform and the support for people being able to do that. Now, once you do have, um, if there was a uh, conference, like we recently had a conference that we supported for deaf entrepreneurs, we had uh, we, a, a deaf employee and we have a hard of a hearing uh, engineer who joined that conference. So it's like, now that we know uh, people have come forward and they've told us that they have a disability, we can help them uh, represent into it at specific events. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. I mean, let's unpack what you've said there. <laughs> Very, I mean, you, you've made so many valid, interesting points. It's really important to provide these people with disabilities the support in the workplace because there are issues that they're going to face with one another. If they're the only person with a disability, we're back to that tokenism that I talked about. And we don't want that to be, a, to be an issue. We want them to be part of the community but we also want them to have somewhere to go. You know, we talk about this in diversity exercises all the time, a safe space. Mm -hmm. And that safe space is other people with disabilities or other people with, you know, other women, other people who might have issues with family members at home. It's, it's really critical to let people realize that they're not that sole lone person. And disability is often thought of as a lonely situation. And it's only made lonely because we're not made aware of other people around us who might have the same, you know, the same disability or the same challenges to get their job done. I hate the word challenges, just so you don't know. <laughs> but it's, it's really important. I mean, for me, growing up as a blind person, I've always thought that I need my community of blind people, if only to find different ways of doing things. You know, it's really key for me to have my friends who are blind around me, but I also enjoy my friends who are not blind. And I enjoy, you know, bringing both circles together and kind of seeing how they work. Sometimes they clash, sometimes it works. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun for me to have a party here where I have a bunch of blind people and a bunch of sighted people and seeing how the two circles slowly start to meld together. It's, it's really quite lovely, but in the end, you need to have an option to go off into a safe place, regather, recollect, and then come back. So those communities are really important. Thank you, Ted. Sure. I, Lucy, I, I do need to interrupt the flow here and say, what's wrong with the word challenge? Because as part of my quarantine exercise routine, I listen to this uh, hip hop Tabata gal and she's always saying, with challenge comes change. And that's her exercise motto. But I kind of, I kind of think it's good because we need to challenge, we kind of need to challenge everyone who's hiring people and everyone who's designing something and everyone who's developing, we need to challenge people to think, you know, you've seen those butt head bubbles in the person, the designer has like a beard and he's a hipster and he's thinking about a guy with a beard and hipster while he's designing. So yeah, I think challenge is good. No, and I think challenge is good, but saying somebody is challenged. Oh, 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 oh yeah, that's bad. You know, saying somebody <laughs> that's bad. I agree with you. Sorry, I misunderstood. I mean, when somebody says, Oh, you're so challenged to doing things, no, I'm not challenged, I'm just doing them differently. But I challenge people definitely to come and think differently and, and understand and, and walk through these, these particular processes. Um, I want to really briefly touch, I think we're getting close to time. I, I forgot to chime. <laughs> Uh, but I want to really briefly ask, why do you guys think it's important to have a person with a disability test products and test your theories and applications? Ted, let's start with you. Okay. Um, engineers are not screen reader experts. So we teach our engineers how to use voiceover on a Mac but they're able to use it enough that they can quickly detect if an object is being announced the way they want it to. 
but they're not going to be able to have the same kind of experience as someone that uses it every day. And they're not necessarily going to be able to use the same equipment. We had a problem recently that we were not aware of. It happened when Chrome um, did an update and they fully supported an ARIA owns attribute. I'm, we still don't know exactly what happened, but essentially we were using ARIA owns incorrectly on some items. And with the recent Chrome update, it completely broke. Now, if I, I would open it up on voiceover on a Mac and it worked fine, but that's because I wasn't using uh, JAWS or NVDA. But we started getting immediate calls from our customers. They use uh, screen readers every day and they're saying this thing broke and we had to figure it out. Um, if you don't have that communication channel where you can hear from people that use your products with this different assist, uh, assistive technology or different methods, or if you don't have someone that's working with you that can check these things with their assistive technology and use, you're only getting like a sliver of the experience. You're not getting the full experience. Um, things like some of it is, is someone that's new to accessibility wants to do so much, but what they don't realize is sometimes they're doing too much. Like for instance, they're creating labels that are too verbose. Um, and someone with a screen reader comes in and says, whoa, 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 that's way too much information. I don't need that. Just give me the basics. Or someone that's using Dragon and they're not able to you know, find that button because the label's been rewritten in such a strange way. Um, there's a difference between theory and reality. Um, and a lot of our engineers, a lot of our designers are still focused in theory. They know what they should do, but they don't have the reality of actually using it on a day-to-day -day basis. Excellent. And Lainey, how about you? Uh, yeah, I agree with everything we've said this whole conversation, which has been great, that without people with disabilities in the mix, there can be a tendency to forget that accessibility is about people. It's not just some code requirement. And this is a problem as a lawyer in the legal space. I'm always running into when people are thinking of accessibility too much as a compliance issue. And I'm always, yes, compliance, of course, we want people to comply with the law, but it can't be the driver because then you leave the people out. And when you bring in disabled people to test products, to build products, to design products, it just bakes in the fact that the whole reason we're doing this is to make the digital world more inclusive. And we can't do it without everyone we want to include. So I think it's critical. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. It, it's, it's really important because developers who are told they need to work for a standard or work to, to comply with X or Y end up presenting it in the end, I find. They, they end up going this stupid accessibility requirement or the stupid security environment even. It's like, I can't work in this space. There's no reason for me to do that. I, I, I don't get it. But when we finally show them that somebody with a disability is using their tool and breaks, it becomes personal for them. They want that person to be able to use their code. You know, engineers, designers, software, coders, what have you, they all have a bit of an ego. And when they see their code break and they see, you know, somebody struggling to use something that they worked on, they, they, I find that they will own that accessibility and become more of an advocate for it themselves is, is in my experience. So, um, We've talked about people with disabilities and we've talked about how we should include them. Where do we find these people with disabilities? What, what, what resources are you two aware of for people to go to for, you know, reaching out and finding people with disabilities? Um, okay, I have two answers to that. First of all, on my website, which is LF, my initials, lflegal.com, there's a resources page. And on that page, I have a category for digital accessibility, um, you know, consultants and also sort of a subcategory for usability testing. And on there, I have a couple of great platforms, one that's run by Nobility in Austin, 
where you can get testing done remotely. I have a lot of nonprofits listed. So I encourage people to check it out. And if anyone listening to this sees something missing, please contact me and I'll be sure to add it in. Um, it's lflegal.com. And then the last thing I wanted to say is when I wrote my book, which is called Structured Negotiation, A Winning Alternative to Lawsuits, the publisher sent it out to some lawyer on the East Coast. And the main comment they got back was, where the hell does she find these people, these clients who want to work in this way? And I have been completely privileged throughout my career that blind people have come to me to work on accessibility issues because people don't really want to file lawsuits. You know, one way you can find people is to have a good complaint system in your organization and track people and reach out to people and don't see people who call in as complainers, see them as gifts that can improve your products and services because that's really what it's all about. Oh, that's fantastic. And Ted, how about you? I think also it depends on your product. Um, if you have a general product versus a very specific product, like for instance, we have accounting software and it really helps us to have feedback from people that understand accounting and small business needs rather than having um, a person that knows how to test, but doesn't necessarily know accounting. One of the things that we do is uh, I worked with uh, several banks and financial companies and we created a set of keywords it's available on my GitHub page, but um, it's a keywords that people use to describe themselves without saying they have disabilities. And we use those keywords to track our feedback mechanisms. So for instance, someone may not say I'm low vision, but they may say that I can't read the great text. Um, so one of the things that we do is we do a monthly review of all of our feedback channels against those keywords, and then we create a report um, and then we share those reports with the teams and then we reach out to people that have, uh, that have reported issues that we can work on. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that you already have customers that are trying to give you feedback and use, uh, use your, your communication methods to go back to those customers and get more information. Plus, we also work with uh, small business owners, our majority of our clientele is that and with TurboTax with taxpayers. But we, we sponsor organizations that help small business owners like uh, the Randolph Shepard Vendors Act, um, the Yantern Summit for Deaf Entrepreneurs as a way of also getting more contact with our customers. I knew I invited the right two people because Lainey talked about the process and how important it is to engage your customers. And then Ted just demonstrated how to do that. I think that's fantastic. Um, so it's really important to engage those customers, engage people with disabilities, but also hire them, bring people into your organization. Is there anything that you would like to say in closing, Lainey? Uh, well, I just want to thank you, Lucy, for inviting us to talk about this issue. And it is so important. And please, audience out there, um, take it to heart and find the resources you need to really bake accessibility into your products and services and culture with people with disabilities through every step of the process. So thank you. And Ted? I think um, there are a lot of companies that support you bringing your, your whole self to work, which means that when you come to work, you don't have to hide your disability, you don't have to hide your sexuality or anything like that. If you can find a company like Intuit that, that supports this, then those are the companies that you should be working for. And so part of that is um, as a company, setting up the structures so that people don't feel like they have to hide the fact that they have anxiety or that they have a child with a disability or that they have a reading disability, they're dyslexic or you know uh, chronic pain. Um, we need to make sure that um, that those people feel like they have the resources and support. And at the same time, those people are also going to be your representatives as they move forward. For instance, I mentioned we have one person who's right now trying to open up uh, discussions about sobriety in the workplace. 
Now, if I was a person that's um, in recovery and I knew that Intuit was a company that fully supported people in recovery, so I'd be more likely to apply it into it than another company that has a bad reputation. It's not something you do overnight, but I think that a company that supports its employees will also uh, be a more diverse company. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate both of you joining me today and I thank you very much. Thanks, Lucy. Thank
and welcome to my session for a future date conference, What I Wish I Learned About Assistive Technology Before I Started College. My name is Veronica Lewis, and I am a student at George Mason University in Virginia studying data science and assistive technology with a special interest in visual impairment. I also run the website Veronica with Four Eyes, which has over 530 free posts on topics related to low vision, assistive technology, college transition, and so much more, written for readers of all ages and skill levels. A lot of people assume I started Veronica with Four Eyes because I've always been an assistive technology power user, but the truth is, that wasn't always the case. In fact, when I first started college, I had a fairly limited assistive technology education. Most of what I had learned about assistive technology at that point came from articles I read online or learning how to solve accessibility problems for myself in the classroom. My school had limited resources for assistive technology and didn't have the time to teach me how to use different tools, so I never had the chance to explore different devices or fully learn my assistive technology preferences until I started attending college. Because of this, I had the challenge of trying to learn how to use assistive technology and trying to learn the new material in my college classes at the same time. While I was successful in doing so, there are many students who aren't able to. In fact, more than 50% of students with visual impairments stop attending college after their first year, with accessibility barriers being a common factor in their decision. One of the ways I am working to help students with low vision and blindness to be successful in college is by sharing my own experiences in a positive and practical way. And today, I will be sharing what I wish I learned about assistive technology before starting college with the help of a few props. While I give a lot of examples involving assistive technology for low vision, these skills are important for all assistive technology users who are planning to attend college or pursue other post-secondary education. One of the first things I learned when I got to college is that not all assistive technology is like that. And by that, I mean nausea-inducing. You see, the first time I ever tried out a screen magnification program in high school, I didn't realize that it would have a flashing window and that the items in focus would quickly shift positions every time I slightly moved my mouse. I ended up getting vertigo from the rapid motion, almost threw up, and refused to go anywhere near a screen magnification program for a while. I would just use the zoom function in a web browser or find some other way to magnify information. When I told this story to one of the assistive technology specialists at my college, they listed off several different magnification programs and settings that I could try out that wouldn't actually trigger my vertigo or the need for additional items, like a barf bag. I learned that I prefer a lens view for magnification over a full screen view, and I learned more about how to disable flashing light effects as well. Even though I thought I would never go anywhere near screen magnification ever again, I'm glad that I gave that tool a second chance, as I use these type of programs and settings a lot now. As it turns out, I don't dislike screen magnification programs. I just dislike the ones that make me sick. Another thing is that just because I use a device or tool regularly, that doesn't mean that I will have the same device until the end of time. For example, my junior year of high school, I had the opportunity to use a desktop video magnifier that I nicknamed the dinosaur. It reminded me of a retro computer and made a lot of weird noises. And it was so heavy that it couldn't be brought to any of my classes. I would have to leave the classroom and go to the library to use it. Even though it was very frustrating to use, I eventually became proficient with using it and figured that once I mastered the dinosaur, I was set for life. Well, once I got to college, I was surprised to find that the dinosaur I was used to using it was basically extinct. All of the video magnifiers in the assistive technology lab were totally different, and a lot of people were confused as to why I had used a device like the dinosaur in high school. This experience taught me that I should take the time to learn how to use multiple types of different assistive technology so that I can easily adapt to using different devices when needed. Another valuable lesson I learned that also involves magnification is that no assistive technology will ever be able to solve everything. I mean, imagine having a magnification solution 
that can zoom in on paper, enlarge items on a computer screen, identify details in a small object, read everything on the board in class, magnify a small menu at a restaurant, and do all of this without running out of battery or causing eye fatigue. Since no assistive technology solution will ever be able to do everything that a user may need, it's important to ensure that students know what tool will work best and when. In my case, I use a handheld magnifying glass like this one or a scanning app to read paper materials and use a program like Zoom or Magnifier when working on my iPad or computer. I use a video magnifier to examine details and objects and have a desktop video magnifier that can help me to see the board in class. As for reading a menu at a restaurant, I like to use my phone as a magnifier or pull up the menu online in large print if I'm in a particularly dark area. Of course, while I have my favorite magnification tools, it's important for me to know how to ask for assistive technology by function, also known as the generic brand. I was having a conversation with my faculty mentor about different assistive technology that I use in the classroom, and they asked me why I kept using specific device and app names whenever I described how I preferred to access materials. They told me that it was important to focus on the core features of assistive technology that I use, such as screen reading capabilities or magnification to a certain percentage, and not to worry about what program will be able to do these things for me. Besides, the technology I use could suddenly become extinct tomorrow if an app is shut down or if my vision drastically changes. After all, I don't need a specific brand of coconut milk in order to make a delicious recipe. I can use this generic brand just fine. However, what if I didn't know what coconut milk was and I had to figure out what it's used for and how it can help me to make something awesome? I might have a bit more trouble making different recipes or deal with frustrating substitutions because I have no idea that coconut milk exists. The same goes for knowing different assistive technology terms and how different assistive technology tools and devices can be helpful both inside and outside the classroom. While it's not overly likely that I'll be able to learn more about assistive technology terminology by flipping through this dictionary, taking a little bit of time to learn how things like high contrast displays, audio description, and alt text can help me as someone with low vision, this can go a long way with helping students to learn more about how assistive technology can help them to be successful. I tell prospective students at George Mason that their disability services file that lists their accommodations is like a blueprint. It can help them to be successful. However, assistive technology is more like a toolbox where they can find their own tools and help to turn those ideas in the blueprint into reality and a successful classroom experience. Another important thing to know other than knowing how to ask for assistive technology is knowing what a device can do and how to use it correctly. At one point, I was talking to my friend about my frustrations with using a screen reader and specifically asked him if there was a way I could duct tape this software's mouth shut as I had no idea how to get it to talk faster or to stop talking. At that point, I had never really used a screen reader before and my friend laughed and showed me how I could change things like the voice speed, pitch, and most importantly, how to get it to stop talking. I hadn't realized how many things I could customize and change to fit my needs. And after that lesson, I started developing my own preferences for how I use screen readers and other technologies. After my friend showed me all the different ways that they can customize assistive technology for their needs, I created several documents that show my preferred settings for the devices and software that I use frequently. I also created documents for things that I use less frequently, so that way I don't have to try and remember what font size I need for a program, or if the inverted screen option is frustrating with certain color schemes. I have an entire post on my website about how I create these documents. You can find it by searching for how I document assistive technology and accessibility preferences. This next thing that I wish I learned before starting college may vary depending on where you live, and is all about learning how to ask for technology and resources from your state or in my case, Commonwealth. A few weeks before I started college, I was referred to the Vocational Rehabilitation Program that is connected with the Virginia Department for the Blind and Vision Impaired, also referred to as the DBVI. 
It wasn't until the end of my freshman year of college, when I met with their assistive technology specialist, that I learned that I could request different devices from the Commonwealth that could help me to be successful in the classroom, up to a certain dollar amount. The assistive technology specialist is also able to recommend different devices for me, like, say, a tablet or a portable scanner. DBVI can purchase those devices at a discount or at no additional cost to me, as long as the technology can be used to help me achieve my goal of graduating college and working for a major technology company in a role related to accessibility or assistive technology. While I haven't used this benefit very often, it is definitely something to keep in mind when considering whether to create a file with the State Department for Vision Impairment. One of the main things that I really wish I learned before starting college is how to use a blindness cane. And yes, blindness canes are assistive technology too. You see, there were a lot of unknowns about my visual impairment and how it would impact me as an adult. Because of this, I never received any orientation and mobility lessons at school, even though I frequently ran into people, walls, trash cans, almost any obstacle you can think of, really. By the time we realized I would benefit from using a blindness cane, which was shortly after I fell down the stairs at my freshman orientation, twice, and almost getting hit by a Toyota Prius in front of my DBVI case manager. By that point, there wasn't enough time for me to start getting formal orientation and mobility lessons before I would have to start at college several hours away. My first day at George Mason was also the first day I started using a blindness cane in public, and I spent the first year or so wondering what I was doing and if I was even using this cane correctly. Luckily, this was corrected by some orientation and mobility lessons at my college, but if we knew more about how my visual impairment would progress over time, I probably would have started looking into orientation and mobility training much sooner, as it would have kept me from getting injured. Of course, a lot of people have that one tool or device they feel like they are not disabled enough to benefit from, or they think that they will learn it whenever they really need it, or when they think they need it. I had assumed for a long time that blindness canes were only for people with no usable vision and didn't think about how it could help me avoid obstacles and incidents like how I fell off a school bus and into a pothole during my senior year of high school. While I can't say that everyone should learn to use a blindness cane like mine, it's important for students to take the time to learn as many assistive technology skills as they can, even if they feel like they aren't necessary. There may come a time when these skills absolutely will be necessary. I'd like to end this talk by saying that I do not blame anybody for not teaching me these things about assistive technology before I started college. As I know that my school district believed that they had prepared me to be able to tackle any technology challenge that may come my way. In a way, they were absolutely correct because I eventually learned all of these skills and have been a successful college student, though I definitely wish I had these skills sooner. I hope that this list of assistive technology skills that I wish I learned before starting college is helpful for people looking to fill in knowledge gaps, learn more practical skills prior to starting college. If you have any more questions about topics related to low vision or assistive technology, or you just want to say hi, feel free to follow me on Twitter or send me an email. My Twitter is at Veron4Ica, spelled V-E-R-O-N, the number four, I-C-A, and my email is veronforica at gmail.com. Thank you for joining me for a future date, and I hope to hear from you at a future time. Hey, thank you for tuning in to a future date. Now we're going to change things up a bit. The next session is live. We've partnered with the Digital Accessibility Legal Summit Conference for an all-star legal panel you won't want to miss. To watch, just jump over to our live stream, which is at youtube.com slash c slash a future date slash live. We've posted links in the description and on your screen and at a future date.com. We'll stay nice and quiet here if you want to keep the stream running in the background. We'll be back at 2.40 Eastern, 11.40 Pacific for the last three talks of the conference. See you then.
Hello, and welcome to Beyond Standards, a holistic approach to accessibility evaluation. My name is Rochelle Bradley Montgomery, and we are going to start with a walk around my neighborhood. Wherever I go at this point, I notice barriers to people with disabilities, and so I just want to highlight a few. This is a sidewalk where a fence has been built too close to a power pole, and that makes it inaccessible to wheelchairs and people with walkers and individuals who have um, strollers. So all of those groups of people have to walk around this telephone pole out into the street in order to go past this area. This is a local post office with a step required for entry. Now this building was built in the 1700s and it hasn't been adjusted for accessibility. So individuals with disabilities in this area can't go in to this particular post office to deliver their mail. Our local library uses an electronic after hours book drop, but the buttons are all flat. There's no braille labels. There's no audio description. And so any individual who is blind is unable to use this to return their books. I run into other barriers um, that I don't have pictures of. And one example of that is essential oil diffusers in local businesses and in our local banks so that people with chemical sensitivity can't go in and use those businesses or bank there. This is another common occurrence and that is confusing signage. And so this accessible entrance sign is pointing at a door at the top of a set of stairs that has no door handle. It obviously is not the accessible entrance, but it leads to the question, where is that particular entrance? But those are the kind of barriers we were running into um, in the physical built environment. But now after COVID-19, we're really experiencing new barriers uh, to interacting with businesses because everything has moved online. So now we have ex uh, even worse problems with inaccessible webinars and social media posts and conversations. If you go to physical buildings, you'll often find carts piled up, warning tape, entrance closures, and other makeshift barriers to movement, but no signage to help people know where to go or where the accessible pathway is, if there is one. Um, hand sanitizer and cleaning solutions are everywhere, which stop people with chemical sensitivity being able to interact. Many, many businesses, restaurants, and other locations have moved to mandatory online ordering or mobile application ordering, as well as making reservations online before coming to places. And all of those systems were set up in a very short period of time with little to no thought about accessibility. And finally, we are using websites more and more in this environment, and they are inaccessible often to people with disabilities. So as we move online, just how bad is it? Well, WebAIM ran an automated assessment last year to review the top million home pages, and they found that 97.8% of home pages had at least one detectable failure of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0. So the home pages of 97.8% of the sites they checked um, violated an international standard for accessibility. And on average, they found that pages had 59.6 errors each. So how bad is it on the web? It is pretty bad from an accessibility standpoint. Now, if you're in the audience and you're asking yourself, is my organizational legally compliant? I'm here to tell you that you're asking the wrong question. You see, despite the Americans with Disabilities Act, that went into place 25 years ago, there is an employment gap that still exists. 65% of the working age population who does not have a disability was employed prior to COVID, and that's been pretty consistent. At the same time, only about 20% or a little bit less of people with disabilities have been employed between 2009 and 2018. And even though there's Section 501, 503, 504, 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, despite executive orders um, 11478 and 13160, so all these new laws that have been put into place, there is still disability-related discrimination. Within 
um, society. A 2010 report found that people with disabilities, a percentage of people with disabilities who socialized with friends, families, or neighbors at least twice a month was 11% fewer than people without disabilities. Um, the same goes for restaurants. People with disabilities went to restaurants 27% fewer people than those without disabilities. And people percentage of people with disabilities who attended religious services was 7% fewer than people without disabilities. And while these statistics are older um, and the newer round of these statistics has not come out yet, this has been consistent. And there are indications that these are still correct from a percentage standpoint. So how do we change this? It's not just looking at the laws. We need to be asking ourselves, is your organization accessible? Is it disability friendly? And the question is, why? Why do this? And of course, there is a legal requirement, but there's also a business requirement to this. You see, 19%, give or take, of the population has a disability. That is one in three households in America includes a member with a disability. And individuals with disabilities hold about $200 billion in discretionary spending. So if you are not accessible, if you are excluding people with disabilities, you are missing about 20% of your possible market right off the bat. There are also some universal benefits to uh, being accessible. Um, one of them is that people experience situational disabilities. I mentioned earlier about somebody who is pushing a stroller. They are having very similar experience to people who are in a wheelchair from a mobility standpoint and accessibility features that serve somebody who is in a wheelchair or using a walker also serves someone who is pushing a cart or pushing a stroller. If you are carrying a large box into a building, ask yourself how often you use an accessible door to get in. Um, there are just a lot of benefits around making sure that the physical environment is accessible. Same thing with the digital environment. If you are outside on your mobile phone in the sunlight, you are having a low vision experience. This is an experience that's going to benefit from websites that are designed to support people with low vision with sufficient contrast. In addition, our population is aging. And as we age, we experience more disabilities. Even if it is only fatigue, making sure the environment is accessible is going to support your population over a large age range. And finally, people experience accidents. And so even if you are not permanently disabled, almost everyone will be temporarily or permanently disabled at some point in their lives. The 2017 uh, census, U.S. Census, found that 2.4% of the population lives with a visual disability, 3.6% of the population lives with a hearing disability, 5.1% of the population has a cognitive disability, 6.9% of the population has an ambulatory disability, 2.6% of the population um, lives with a disability that affects their self-care, and 5.8% of the population lives with a disability that affects their independent living. And while these are all US statistics that I'm pulling from, they relate to a worldwide population. If you want to be able to reach the most people possible for your organization, you should be thinking about accessibility. But with all these benefits, why are we so inaccessible. And there's some barriers. The first is cost. It takes a certain amount of money to be put aside, preferably sooner rather than later, because the longer you go, the more expensive it costs, to become accessible. It also takes attention. You have to pay attention to becoming accessible, and then you have to pay attention to re remaining accessible. And all of us in this world, but particularly organizations that are smaller, have a very limited amount of attention to spend on uh, things that are outside of the scope of their day-to-day -day survival. That is particularly true right now with, with the COVID-19 crisis. 
there's also a time commitment. It takes time to think about what is accessible, what isn't accessible, and how you're going to improve. There's often grants or other opportunities to make improvement, but it takes time in order to get those. And finally, expertise is a big barrier. If you want to have an organization that's fully accessible, you need to have expertise in architecture and all of the related physical environment uh, regulations. You need to understand web development, social media, and electronic accessibility, as well as accommodations and policies and procedures, and all of the practice that goes around hosting something like an accessible event. There are standards and guidelines in many of these areas, but it takes a level of expertise to know these. So in short, the barriers to becoming accessible are more visible than the benefits to becoming accessible. And as long as that is the case, I believe we are going to be in the same situation we have been in for a number of years. So the charity I lead called Accessible Community has set out to try to shift that paradigm and begin to make the benefits more visible than the barriers. And the first step to doing that is to think about accessibility from a holistic framework point, from a holistic point of view, and make all of that knowledge and expertise available to organization leaders, business owners, people who, who do not have the time to learn it in a way that can help them figure out how accessible they are and how to move forward. And so we look at it holistically as um, first and foremost facilities, so built the built environment, which we pull from the ADA facility checklist as well as universal design best practices. And those together create an overarching picture of what makes a good built environment uh, for people with disabilities as well as just people in general. Then we look at web accessibility and we rely on WCAG 2.0, 2.1, 2.2, and the evolving standards around web accessibility. In addition, we are looking at mobile accessibility and that is WCAG 2.1, but also best practices from BBC, Apple, and others who have really put research into and around making the mobile space accessible. We look at universal design best practices and Section 508 uh, for kiosk accessibility and the accessibility of what's called self-contained products. So the kind of kiosk items that are physically uh, independent from the web uh, and, and other electronic medium, they stand on their own. We look at WCAG 2.0 for audio, video, and multimedia content, and that really includes social media, which is one of the big areas that people need to think about from an organizational standpoint. And finally, we look at policies and practices and behaviors, um, and we pull from ADA requirements for that. We look at best practices from groups which support people with disabilities, and we look at our lessons learned from working with organizations. So we have been working to take all of that information and put it together in some kind of package that can work for individuals who do not know accessibility uh, at a, an expert level. And with that in mind, another area that we have thought about from a holistic standpoint is that an organization size changes the approach to accessibility. And I want to call out the Disability Equality Index because it provides a wonderful support system, a wonderful evaluation tool for large organizations. It really focuses on what does accessibility look like for an organization that has resources and uh, the knowledge and expertise to put towards becoming truly accessible. It is a wonderful tool um, and I think every one of us is trying to work towards becoming or promote, proposing and supporting the concept of being as accessible as possible. But for small and medium organizations, they have a very different problem set. They have a much more limited set of resources. They have limited leverage. So whereas a really big company can go into a city or a community and ask for changes like improvements to sidewalks or uh, local crosswalks or other areas within their community, smaller businesses don't have that kind of leverage. They often don't own their own building 
or they're in historic neighborhoods and districts that have limitations on what can be done to the buildings. They have very few specialists. Small businesses, small organizations really have one person or a few people who are doing many different jobs. So they don't have someone who can dedicate their time specifically to fixing or addressing accessibility. And in fact, when we start talking about web accessibility or social media accessibility, they often have volunteers or friends or somebody they hired just once to create a web page. And so going back and getting those things fixed have a different complexity level than for large organizations that have a web team on site. And finally, they are more likely to use tools and prepackaged content like GoDaddy or WordPress. And so as a result, they have more limitations around what they can do to fix accessibility. So achieving accessibility with limited resources is really about prioritizing what you're going to do. It's about making trade-offs and it's trade-offs across different areas. So it becomes incredibly important when you start having this conversation to include people with disabilities in that conversation. One of the number one things I hear from talking with other individuals with disabilities is the importance of engaging them as part of this process, the process of becoming more accessible. So I want to talk about two trade-off examples that I've run into. Um, so the first one is a bookstore. It's located in a historic neighborhood. It is in a building that the owner does not own. And the front of that building, which has uh, the main entrance, is not accessible. It has two steps up that you have to go through in order to get into the building. Well, the building owner has a different set of priorities than the business owners in that building, and they won't fund a ramp or a lift. And so the business owners are, are kind of stuck at this point. They can continue to push for the business owner, the building owner to make changes, but assuming they aren't going to be successful, what are they going to do with the situation? So the other part I want to just state here is that the majority of disabled customers for this particular bookstore are from two nursing homes. And so there is a space here to make some decisions. They obviously have the option to move locations, but that is difficult and expensive uh, and costs a certain amount of reputation. And so what can they do? So a couple different things. The first of they can make sure their inventory is available on the web and that the web becomes an accessible portal for people who cannot get into the physical building to browse books and to make purchases and selections. They can also offer a service which allows people to um, order and then come to the front door and get pickup or have their books delivered. This particular bookstore does incredible work as far as bringing authors in and doing events. And so another compromise they've chosen to do is to go to nursing homes and other fully accessible spaces where their customer base is and hold the events there. And so this is a set of compromises that works for their customers. Now, there are people with disabilities who would not be comfortable with this set of compromises because they want to browse a book collection. But for this particular group, for this particular place that worked with their core customer base, moving events and delivering content and services where the individuals are really works for them. So having that conversation is extremely valuable. This is another trade-off space. Um, this is an ice cream store near us, and it is located in a, an old warehouse. When you walk in these doors, there is a set of steps that go straight up. So they don't have, again, the ability to make changes to the building itself. And so instead, they have um, addressed making changes to the space around the building. Now they have put in a ramp so that uh, a wheelchair can go up directly next to the accessible parking space. They have um, put in a 
call button. So as soon as you get to the door, you can call. And when it's open, they have a patio space that is also accessible where you can eat your ice cream that gets delivered directly down the stairs um, by an employee. And you can then use that off to the right. It's covered during the summer. And so this is another compromise space where they have tried to modify it to meet the needs of their community and individuals with disabilities. Now, in both of these situations, there are people who are not going to be happy with those solutions. But these business owners these are really trying to meet the needs of the people who they are, are interacting with. And having those conversations and continuing to involve and improve is a great way uh, to do this. And especially when you start talking about, well, let's tie in the website, let's tie in a phone service, or we're going to have policies that when the button is rung, our employees are going to drop what they're doing and somebody's going to come provide service to an individual at the door. So it becomes a holistic solution that is set within the community that the business or organization is within. And we've talked to a number of organizations that are doing solutions like this and we have come up with a process that we are proposing and working on and trying to develop in order to both reduce barriers but also increase rewards for organizations that are, are working towards becoming accessible and our focus for our particular charity is really around those smaller and medium-sized organizations that are resource constrained so um, the first tool that is available is Tally, and it is ta11y.org, and it is an evaluation tool. So that framework I talked about that addresses facilities and events and web accessibility, all of that information has been put into a single tool that walks a completely novice user through conducting an accessibility evaluation. There are instructions there will be pictures um, and, and it just is designed to be as easy as possible and one of the great benefits of putting this kind of information into a tool is that the minute you tell the tool that you don't have something it just takes out huge portions of questions that you don't have to think about anymore so for example if you don't have a public restroom it's not going to ask you questions about public restrooms once you have an organization leader has completed that tool, we are working on a report that will recommend solutions. So it's going to take information from uh, individuals who live with disabilities, as well as lessons learned and known best practices, and it's going to recommend alternatives and solutions to the organization owner. We plan on hosting a platform that's tied to that that will in, uh, engage the disability community, really allow business owners to ask for input and have conversations about what the right solution is for them um, based on the trade-off space that's available. We have uh, two primary stakeholders in this. We have the organization leaders themselves and we have disability experts. And in all of our tools, we treat disability experts as a aggregate of individuals with disabilities who have lived experience with those disabilities, caretakers who also have a lived experience, and accessibility experts. And we aggregate them and do not distinguish between them because we are trying to protect the best of our ability, uh, the privacy rights of individuals with disabilities, and be sensitive to the fact that information online can be um, risky. And so the first level of defense is to not actually call that out. We do um, take information that they provide uh, with permission and feed that back to organizations. Uh, once solutions have been implemented by organizations and changes are made, we then try to take lessons learned back from them and feed it back into the tool for the next organization. So that's Tally, and that's the evaluation tool. The tool we are just beginning on is called Socially, S-O-C-I-A-1-1-Y, and it will be at socially.org. And it is a user rating and review site. And so it allows uh, disability experts to provide ratings, comments, photographs of the different organizations that they interact with. And when we talk to individuals with disabilities, uh, and also just based on my lived experience, there are two 
needs or behaviors that we really want to be able to support with a tool. And the first one is being able to save time by finding places that you can be successful. So um, I live with chemical sensitivity. I go into certain stores and have to leave immediately. Sometimes I'm sick because I didn't realize I was going to have a problem ahead of time. If somebody can recommend to me or I can recommend to them where is risky and where is not. I have a much higher percentage chance of being successful or not getting sick when I try to do my grocery shopping or try to go clothes shopping. Um, similarly for people, in, uh, individuals who are in wheelchairs or individuals who um, have other disabilities, there are just these barriers and knowing where they are ahead of time saves so much time. And so it is common for people with disabilities to recommend to friends who have similar disabilities that they should try a place or not try a place. And we want to make that available on a wider scale. This has been done in different test trials and in smaller scales, uh, different research programs for crowdsourcing accessibility, but it hasn't been done on a large scale yet. And that is what we are aiming to do. We want to take all of that information and also plug it into a searchable interface along with the information from Tally because we want organization owners and leaders to be able to tell people with disabilities that they are working in certain areas. We want to recognize that not every organization is going to be 100% successful for the, in supporting every group with disabilities. We want them to get there, but it's going to be a process. And so we want to be able to provide a way for organizations to let groups of people know when and what they are doing and and how they're succeeding and at the same time be able to provide that feedback back to the organization that lets them know um, how they're doing and so all of that gets put into a single searchable interface that is available to people who want to go out uh, and interact in their community to be able to see where they're going to be successful and where they're not and so these two tools together will provide a a database for individuals to look at organizations and for organizations to visibly advertise their support. When I go work with organizations, smaller organizations that are trying to be accessible, the number one question they get is, all right, I'm putting in the work. How do I reach a community of people with disabilities? And this platform is designed and thought out to do this. So we are at the beginning of this and our first tool is Tally. Uh, this is a screenshot of that tool and you will see that you start an assessment, you sign in, you can do as many assessments as you want. It is tied to Google right now um, for sign in and authentication. Um, but on the left is a series of different sections, uh, things like goods and services or interior routes, facility parking, web content, and each section allows you to start an assessment. And within each quest, uh, section, there is a question, and those questions are usually yes, no, but sometimes um, very simple uh, questions like the number of parking spaces and based on those answers it feeds you the next question and you have a comments field to just capture data. We are enhancing this over the next month or two with images that make this clearer as well as it already includes additional instructions or clarifications that you might need. It walks you through from beginning to end of that entire process and when you are complete you can then request a report that will give you all of the areas that you need to improve on. So our next steps are to continue refining Tally and then also build out socially which is the rating site and both of those are going to be available. I mean, Tally is already available, socially will be available later this year. We will continue to test and refine. This is available to you and we welcome all constructive feedback and assistance. If you want to try the tool out and provide comments back, you can email me directly at rochelle at accessiblecommunity.org or info at accessiblecommunity.org will also make it to me. Um, and you can learn more. You can learn more about me and my background at LinkedIn and the LinkedIn profiles here as a link and at the charity, which is accessiblecommunity.org. We are passionate about making our communities accessible to everyone and making sure that people with disabilities are able to succeed and successfully engage in their communities in a way 
that allows them to give back to the community and also actively participate. Thank you very much for your time.
Welcome to Building an Accessible Culture in Higher Ed. My name is Sarah Ferguson. I am the Program Director for Digital Accessibility at Brandeis University. Hi all, my name is Esther Brandon, the Digital Literacy Specialist at Brandeis. Given the current state of the world, we are very excited for the opportunity to share a somewhat compressed version of our presentation from March. Since we can't all be together in the same room, we've provided a couple of photos of us. Here I am with my adorable dog whom I adopted. And here's a photo of Esther with the very cute dog that she kidnapped, but that's a story for another day. So building an accessible culture. Notice the ING in the title. We aren't done yet. This is a process. Building accessible culture requires transformation and a lot of time and a lot of effort, as I'm sure you all know. And accessibility evolves with student needs and the rapidly changing technological landscape. We need to continue to evaluate what is accessible based on our student expectations every year. So we're gonna talk about our continuing journey to becoming a more accessible university. As you go through your own journey, just remember people need time to adjust. Nothing's gonna happen overnight and don't let the slow movement get you down. Focus on making things better and building on the improvements that you make each day. Make it better today than it was yesterday. I also wanna mention my favorite saying that perfection is the enemy of good. Making something 80% accessible is much better than 0%. Don't let fear get in the way. Doing something is always better than doing nothing. The accessibility journey in each community starts in a slightly different place. When you first arrive on the scene, you need to do a little bit of assessment of the state of your community. If you haven't been there all that long, talk to people who have been there forever. Every university has people who've been there for decades. They are a great source of information when it comes to the overall culture at your university. People are afraid of change, no matter what kind of change it is. And knowing how past changes have gone over is really helpful as you make your own approach to changing the culture of accessibility on your campus. When it comes to accessibility, it's important to know if there is any underlying hostility, misunderstanding, or fear on campus. This will make a big difference in how you approach this transformation. A lot of people don't really understand what accessibility means, and fear of the unknown is going to be a huge impediment to change. You may have to start out by quietly and gradually spreading awareness of what accessibility is all about and its benefits before you can start making demands of people. Other things to, uh, to assess include thinking about what your community is doing well. Every community is doing something well and you should identify that and show your appreciation. Point out these positives to encourage momentum. And of course, there are going to be plenty of things that you identify that need to be worked on. Everyone has issues with resources that is universal with universities, a few exceptions. Brandeis definitely included. We've achieved all that we have with very limited dedicated resources. I am actually the only person who's dedicated to web accessibility on campus, and that can be disheartening, but this is the reason why the next question you ask yourself is so very important. Who are your allies? Every place has little pockets of advocacy. You might not know they're there and they might not be where you expect them. I certainly expected student accessibility support to be among my allies and they were, but I also found allies in lots of other places as you can see on this list. Some in the first year, some not for several years. Esther and I actually met through acquaintances who were allies to accessibility. Accessibility is not in her job title or necessarily even part of her original job description, but as an accessibility advocate, it's a passion of hers. Luckily, she had a boss who supported that interest. Allies can be a treasure trove of resources, ideas, and positivity. They can help keep you going. They provide a safe space for venting your frustrations and make you feel like you're not all alone in fighting the good fight. I have found most of my best allies in unexpected places. They've helped me to grow both professionally and personally. 
finding people who support me in this fight is essential for my own emotional well being and the success of the programming I offer on campus. And of course, naturally, you have to assess the knowledge gaps, and there will be many of them. I mentioned earlier the importance of identifying fear and misunderstanding on campus. These gaps in understanding are even more important to fix in some ways than the skills-based gaps. If people don't understand why they're doing the extra work to attain accessibility, they're less inclined to be open to learn how. Once they have an understanding, they often become hungry to learn those skills. On a college campus, accessibility is key for the students who need it to be successful in their schoolwork and their lives in general. When identifying gaps, I learn the most from listening to students' experiences and their difficulties navigating campus life. Some things that might not occur to me are an issue for some specific students, and even the best intentions can go awry, like facilities placing a braille sign upside down. So now that you've finished your assessment, you know where you are as a community. So the next step is to think about where do you want to be? What are your goals? You need to be reasonable in your expectations. Do by all means have lofty goals, but expect change to be slow. It's important to have that roadmap to chart your progress. It will give you a sense of accomplishment to help keep you going. And it's important to demonstrate your progress to the administration. No matter how little the resources you're getting, you got to speak to why you should keep getting them. Change can be slow and it can be easy to lose sight of how far you have come. Having specific goals and a roadmap will help in that transition. So here we have a breakdown of our accessibility journey along parallel tracks. They all start in slightly different places, they all have their own obstacles, and they all affect one another. The focus will shift from track to track as time goes on. You make a little progress in one track, then another. One track might temporarily move in the wrong direction, oddly enough, due to progress in another track. But the overall goal is to get all of the tracks fully on board. So when I say administrative support, um, I'm of course talking about high level administration, the president, the provost, et cetera. But for my experience, I'm also talking about marketing and communications. This is where my position was founded. So I've had most of my support and access to higher administration through that. The accessibility squad is what the other accessibility advocates and I call ourselves. Naturally, it includes anyone who works with accessibility directly, plus any of those allies and advocates I've been collecting over the years. And I really feel we need to get Accessibility Squad t-shirts made at some point because we are a real team. Yes, we do. <laughs> um, our academics track includes faculty, students, deans, and people helping to support the creation of course materials. And our last track, culture, which is an overall feeling on campus. Do students with accessibility issues feel welcome and heard? What is the community feeling towards those students? Are people able to have open conversations? These are some of the questions we ask ourselves when talking about culture. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of our accessibility journey at Brandeis. I'm starting just before 2015 because 2015 marks when the web accessibility specialist position was created. Just prior to 2015, the university decided to redesign the website. The web team in communications knew it needed to be responsive and accessible. They did their research and they pushed the administration to hire an in-house expert. Support for this move came from student accessibility support who provide accommodations and most effectively from the senior associate provost. So that is one of those key allies. Right, and so Sarah was hired as the web accessibility specialist. Woo woo. <laughs> uh, so accessibility and academics um, at this point was entirely reactive. Um, they followed the medical model of making accommodations for individual student needs, and the Student Accessibility Services Office um, was the one making those accommodations. Um, in terms of culture, there was really no open conversation about accessibility on campus. In 2015, 
the web accessibility specialist, me, was hired to ensure the outside developer who was working on the website was providing an accessible website design and functionality. We actually had a lot of back and forth with the developer testing and retesting. So it was very, very important that we had someone um, who had actual expertise in accessibility. I also created a plan for all content being migrated from the old site to the new site to be made accessible at the time of editing and review. I trained my fellow members of the web team in content best practices for accessibility, things like using headings, using alt text, stuff like that. They were the first people on campus to get accessibility training. So conversations about how to spread awareness of accessibility began between Sarah and Student Accessibility Services. They did the initial needs assessment on campus and began creating documentation. In 2016, Brandeis hired an academic technologist. That was Esther. Yay, so I supported faculty. Um, we also identified some allies on campus. We began to build relationships and cultivate ideas for how to get the ball rolling. In 2017, the first pages of the new site start to go live. There are over 20,000 pages all being manually migrated. So we're still not done with this project to this day. We run on a decentralized model, which means we have over 450 people on campus with editorial privileges to some part of the site. This is frightening to say the least. Um, as we finish each chunk of the website, before handing over the keys to a shiny new accessible pages, the web editor assigned to maintain those pages must go to accessibility training. We need them to be able to maintain the accessibility of the pages and only introduce new content that is accessible. Also in 2017, conversations with our media services team ramp up. These are the people on campus who film events, uh, will film lectures for classes. So we started discussing new solutions and guidelines for standardizing captioning. Brandeis' first instructional designer was also hired that year. In terms of academics, the instructional designer support and knowledge was very valuable in helping faculty to create accessible course materials. We also debuted our first FACET training program, uh, which was a small but invaluable uh, program where we had faculty members learn through a series of six workshops how to change their overall teaching styles um, in order to make their content more accessible. Um, and those faculty members ended up convincing colleagues to join the following year um, and really sp help spread the message of accessibility. Um, also, there was a digital accessibility help desk created to support the Brandeis community, uh, mostly answered by Sarah. They would help answer questions that came out of training and would also provide support for people making materials accessible. So in 2018, um, over 100 people have been trained in the basics at this point. Those trainings are continuing but demand for more skills has led to the introduction of a Microsoft Word and PDF remediation hands-on workshop. In addition, a gap is identified in accommodation support and a graduate student-focused accommodation specialist is hired. In 2018, student advocacy really ramped up on campus. There was a student survey that was sent out about accessibility needs on campus, all student-run. Um, students also wrote op-eds in uh, student newspapers about accessibility, um, and the demand got so great that the uh, Brandeis president led a town hall to hear from students, faculty, and staff. Uh, this led to movement on increased administrative buy-in, uh, which involved more resources, um, including financial resources, which were really key towards our efforts. Um, working in the library, um, I began my role as a digital literacy specialist, and I began a universal design for learning workshop series to support faculty. In 2019, a call for advanced accessibility skills increases. More topics are added from advanced PDF techniques, things like forms, to writing effective descriptions, to producing accessible InDesign files. 
The pace of change really starts to pick up at this point. The Office of Equal Opportunity is created, a 504 coordinator is hired, and students now have an official system for lodging any and all complaints regarding accessibility and discrimination. In addition, Communications hires two student workers who have disabilities, and they provide a unique perspective to our work. Another instructional designer is also hired to support faculty at this time. So our FACET program in the second year had a huge amount of interest. Our enrollment expanded by over 250%, and we actually had to turn some faculty away. Uh, the Dean of Arts and Sciences publicly called for accessible course materials, starting with accessible syllabi, which was a huge, huge win for our efforts and also to uh, creating and maintaining this accessible culture on campus. So therefore, we had to create um, even more trainings um, to create not only a welcoming academic environment for students with disabilities, uh, but also to work on creating more accessible materials. Administration starts communication with the community about our accessibility gaps in earnest. This resulted in the administration making Ally a focus. So we have a contract writer for accessible software that was introduced facilities planning and actions to make buildings more accessible. They provided more funding uh, to, for gaps um, in our accessibility training and services. And they're also listening to the community. Uh, this is really where we began our transition from the reactive to a proactive model. All right. So here we are in 2020. Over 350 people have been trained. Migration is coming to an end. Forget about mandatory training for web editors in migration. People from all over campus are asking to be trained. They're not web editors necessarily, but they wanna be included. They wanna know, what's the buzz about? I, I wanna do my part for accessibility like everyone else. Training is now mandatory for all web editors. So those in and out of migration, if you're part of a graduate school, if you're part of a center, you are also um, tasked with taking training. Anyone who makes any digital materials is encouraged to come to training. So that's pretty much everyone. There's no need to chase people down. Actually, I can barely keep up with demand for training. The position of program director was created this year to reflect the hard work done and the accomplishments made. There's still a ways to go, but so much has changed. Yep. So uh, training, a training program for all faculty begin to make course materials accessible. Um, and thanks to this global situation, asynchronous online courses are being developed for the entire community to continue the momentum of skill building. The Center for Teaching and Learning introduced boot camps for faculty to build skills for online teaching, as well as universal design for learning, taught by yours truly. Um, I also started an initiative uh, within the library for all library materials to be examined for accessibility improvements. Students are continuing to be vocal, writing op-eds in the student newspapers, um, and uh, asking their faculty members about making these materials accessible. So hearing guidance about accessibility from all sides has really helped build this accessible culture on campus. In addition, we've also introduced an internship for digital accessibility on campus, and we had our first uh, web accessibility intern this semester. The semester hasn't quite gone the way we planned, but we're continuing this um, online and hope to pick it up in the fall as well. There's been a ton of interest in it. Oh, and we've also gotten um, optical character recognition scanners. So faculty, as they're scanning course materials, will be able to have readable PDFs for students. So while this uh, initiative is on hold for the next few months, we're looking forward to expanding that when we return to campus. Looking to the future, here are our goals. Some are loftier than others. We would love to see accessibility training, at least at an introductory level, be mandatory for all community members. That includes even students. I think uh, it would help the overall culture for students to also be educated in what accessibility is all about. 
Having a dedicated accessibility department with its own budget would lend clout and make changes move a little faster, as opposed to the current model where we walk around with cap in hand begging for money. We'd like to see all digital materials accessible, all buildings be ADA compliant. I would love to see my old position of web accessibility specialist filled to double the work done out of my office. Uh, on the academic side, I'd love to see all course materials made accessible from the get-go, including all educational technologies to be accessed by a screen reader and any other uh, accessibility needs our students have. We would love to see every scanner on campus uh, to include software for optical character recognition and text tagging. So um, we've already rolled out four licenses to machines this year before we had to go off campus uh, and looking forward to more when we return. In terms of our accessible culture, we want everyone to feel welcome in the community and to be heard. We would also love to be running fully on a proactive model. So that's our history up till now and a hopeful glimpse to the future. Now a few tips and specifics. So when you're training, it can be tempting to cram in as much as possible into accessibility training. People have limited time. They're going to complain, you know, oh my God, you need me for an hour. You need me for 90 minutes. Let's get this over. So people might have limited time, but they also have limited attention spans and ability to absorb information. Start them off with an introduction, teach them enough to get started and to make a change so that what they're working on is in fact more accessible than before they met you. If you do a good job sparking an interest, most of them will actually come back to you asking for more. Keep your attitude positive and your mind open during training. Don't lecture at them. Make it a conversation. Make your people comfortable so that they can ask questions. Allow them to meet with you privately if necessary. Help attendees realize how they use accessibility in their daily lives. Examples include curb cuts, elevators, and captions. You can blow their mind when they realize how much video they themselves watch with the sound off and how much they appreciate when a video on social media has captions. Use hands-on demos to ingrain in their memory how much of a difference their cooperation will make. In our trainings, we do screen reader and keyboard-only navigation demos and describe specific instances of the effect a decision can make on a student from their point of view. For example, using a heading properly or deciding to use a descriptive link instead of a click here. Get them to the moment where the light bulb goes on for each attendee, then you have them. Right, so faculty and staff are often overwhelmed and overburdened in higher education. And I have found training to be the most successful when you celebrate their small achievements, focusing on small and concrete changes people can make uh, that actually make a really big impact on their students' lives. So that can be from um, administrative policy updates to physical building improvements, faculty and staff spotlights on creating accessible material. We want to find a hook for people to really show how making things accessible improves the lives of the students they care so much about. We also wanna highlight when advocacy works, especially with student activism. Students' voices are so important in the university setting, and we need to make sure that they're heard. Language is also really important, especially when building a culture. How do you talk about accessibility or ally or students with disabilities? Aligning language with a social model can really help. And also, lastly, to remind them that this is not a fad. Ally is here, it's real, and we can't wait to help. Thank you so much for your time today. Please feel free to contact us with any questions. Thank you, everyone. So we have a little bit of time left over uh, and we had prepared some prompts for the post live presentation discussion. So we're just throwing these up here, some ideas to get people thinking and sharing experiences. We're gonna stick around and we're gonna answer your questions in the chat but also feel free to answer these questions and share your experiences. Thank you again very much for joining us today.
Good afternoon. My name is Bethany Servan, and I am the marketing director here at Usable Net. It's my great pleasure to thank you for attending today's session for the virtual conference, A Future Date, and welcome you to our presentation. Your speakers today are Jason Taylor, Tanner Gears, and Joseph De Niro. Now, without further ado, I'll hand the presentation over to Jason Taylor to get us started. Great. Thank you, Bethany. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through the agenda so people can understand what we're going to try to cover on this. Um, it's going to be a sort of a, a discussion between myself, uh, Tanner, and Joe, um, and bring you sort of re real world examples to each one of these. I'll start with the introductions so you um, get to know who the panelists are who's, who's speaking today. Um, we want to talk about um, where user testing from the, with the disability community fits into the, your overall accessibility strategy, when you should be thinking about doing testing uh, and how it fits together with other things that you might be doing. Um, we want to look at um, why the, or, well, the external factors um, are sort of increasing the demand for this type of testing. Um, look at a typical project um, and then go into the skill sets of the, um, uh, we would recommend that you look for um, when you're looking for testers from the disability community um, and then talk about how, how to engage and where to find some of those testers um, at different levels. So um, we want to be open as possible to how um, the different levels of, of user testing you can, you can get. Um, I thought I'd just start with some introduction. So um, my name is Jason Taylor. I work for UsableNet. We're a web accessibility company. Um, we essentially work with lots of clients, making sure that their sites are accessible. We bring together technology and services to do that. Um, and part of that service is, is to provide user testing from the disability community to uh, verify um, uh, the accessibility of, uh, of websites, apps, and, and other types of digital products. Um, I wanted to first introduce you to Tanner Gears of the American Foundation for the Blind and Tana, maybe you could give us a, just a brief introduction around American Federation uh, for the Blind and your role there, please. Yeah, thanks, Jason. It's a real pleasure to be here. American Foundation for the Blind was founded in uh, 1921. It was probably most famous for the organization that Helen Keller committed 40 years of her professional life to. Uh, today, uh, our strategic plan focuses on three verticals around education, employment, and the aging population for people with blindness or vision loss. And so as technology and medicine intertwine together in this rapidly advancing age, we're, we're doing our best to support the blind and visually impaired community, whether it's a baby from birth because they are now living and are living with disabilities, or it's that aging population who might be having macular degeneration and are now coming into uh, the blindness community. I oversee business development and sales in our consulting uh, department. Uh, we, uh, similar to UsableNet, we help uh, drive the accessibility and usability of digital assets for organizations to ensure that those verticals, education, employment, and the aging population are able to live their lives to the fullest. Great, Tana. Uh, I think it's relevant for us to, to make people aware that you are blind yourself. Maybe you could give us a brief sort of description of your journey um, uh, uh, up until today. Yeah, um, thanks, Jason. So I I have, I'm in a unique position, and I represent what um, many individuals in today's world are facing. I actually became blind as an adult um, in an auto accident. So I woke up in the hospital totally blind, uh, came into the world, uh, into this new world, um, just facing unknown, just completely, I was completely oblivious to the barriers that uh, the blindness and visually impaired community faces. And so I have dedicated my career and my life to um, civil rights as it relates to accessibility, usability, and people um, living with blindness and vision loss. Right. So actually a, a connection here, obviously, with the um, AFB and Helen Keller um, is actually Joseph De Niro, um, uh, worked within the Helen Keller Services for the Blind in New York. Joe, maybe you give a quick introduction to Helen Keller Services, your role there, 
um, that would be very useful for the for the listeners. Thank you, Jason. Um, so my name is Joseph De Niro. I am an assistive technology specialist with Helen Keller Services for the Blind. Um, and much like AFB, Helen Keller Services um, provides services um, to the visually impaired community um, in, in the same areas, education, um, uh, vocational training, and um, uh, services for the, for the Asian community. Um, my role is within uh, vocational services. I uh, do assessments of clients and provide training to clients so that they either can go to school with a vocational goal or to give them training so that they um, can pursue a vocational goal immediately. Great. And Joe, you also had a, um, you became blind later in life. Maybe you could give us a little bit of background on that if you feel comfortable. Yes. Um, so I, I, I worked prior to my role in Helen Keller Services. I, I, I worked about 10 years in, in the hotel industry. And um, during my stint there, I was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa, which is a degenerative retinal disease. Um, and uh, so my role in life has sort of evolved. I went, I went back to school for computer science and then um, over the last few years, I've been working um, with Helen Keller Services, and as well as Usable Net uh, as a as a user uh, tester with with Usable Net as well. Great. So we've got some really uh, good sort of practical stuff that we want to bring to you to this discussion today. So um, what I wanted to start with is making sure that it's clear where we practically see. Um, you should be involved in people with disabilities as part of your accessibility strategy. So if I look at that from a, a general uh, sort of strategy position, uh, we, we talk at Usable Net about making sure that you've got three core principles covered um, when you're talking about accessibility strategy. So one is that we believe that the, the best way to avoid, uh, to make things accessible to everybody and to avoid things like legal suits is to create the best possible experience for assistive technology users. And that should be primarily verified by people who use um, uh, those types of technologies on an active basis. So I'm going to talk to ask Joe about um, in a second about um, where where that sort of testing best fits in, in his practical sense. Um, we also talk about making sure that you you dovetail that with um, making sure that you're updating updating all of your UX and code like HTML and JavaScript to comply with WCAG. That is going to make sure that if your site follows WCAG, the assistive technology that people are using are going to have an easier time making sure that they can use your site. And then thirdly, we talk about part of the strategy should be communicating the effort and investment that you've made. Um, and making sure that it's easy for people who are having issues with websites or apps to communicate with you from the disability community. So this sort of three level principle um, uh, might be useful for people who are looking at, well, how do I create a strategy and what, what are the most important aspects of that strategy? So first, great experience, test it with people who use assistive technology, make sure you're following WCAG guidelines as closely as you can across all of the aspects of your site and communicate the effort and investment. Um, on that first element in terms of involving people, and this is really what it's about this, this whole session, Joe, maybe practically you can tell me where, you, where today you typically uh, are deploying resources to do testing um, for people. Um, so where in the sort of life cycle of, of the sort of accessibility journey um, are you finding that those, those resources most useful? Well, as far as what I do with UsableNet, um, I, I'm involved in in different stages in the in that in that process. So um, we we will do user testing up front as part of a, an initial assessment with audits, and you know all of a you know sort of a package of services. Um, we then will do testing. Uh, you know, following up once we've done initial reports to to a client, and you know, once they've done remediation to their site, we will do follow up testing to make to verify that the the remediation that they did on the site um, 
is is good. And yeah, you know, another aspect is is if a, a client does a refresh on their site. You know, a lot of e-commerce sites will refresh the look of their site every year and a half or two. So we'll be involved in that process as well with uh, you know longstanding clients. Great. And and Tana, I know that um, AFB have a range of programs. One of them that actually stands out is that they they do uh, they do certification sort of around that sort of communication of effort and investment. Could you talk about how uh, AFB uh, provide a sort of uh, a certification component um, when you're working with particular clients? Yeah, certainly a great question. So one of the 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 principles that that we are driven by is can a end user access and utilize or function within the digital asset as designed and intended. And so we start there. And then from that moment, uh, once we integrate within a team and we can ensure that the core critical elements, very similar to usable nets uh, approach, um, once those core critical elements are um, indeed verified to be usable, that's when we begin to expand out and start checking those boxes of the various standards. So we kind of take an upside down approach in that regard, and that might be integrated from, um, you know, supporting with regards to strategy and process, maybe from the wireframe stage. And then that also um, is effective, um, you know, post launch when in, an, in a remediation type of uh, effort. So that's how, um, that's how we will approach verification and certification of um, the usability and accessibility of a digital asset. Great. So let's talk about sort of where this increased demand is coming from. And I've, I've put together a little uh, a little list of where we tend to find clients um, deciding that they want to really make sure that they're engaging people with user uh, with, with from the dispute community in user testing as part of the strategy. And I, and I, and I think it's important. Um, to sort of mix these up, that it's not just one reason or, or, or one direction. And I'm going to get Tanner and, uh, and Joe to help me here, but just just to give you an idea, you know, the the, the number one reason why you know m most people should be including people with usability is uh, people with uh, disability community is because that's the end goal. The end goal is to make sure that the website is used by people with disability. Now, there's some there's some obviously that we've seen a headline around uh, around the legal side. Um, most legal uh, actions are brought by people with disabilities. So clearly, if you want to make sure that you try and avoid um, lawsuits, you should make sure that your website works for people with disabilities. Um, that's a clear, easy way to make sure that you're at least feeling strong, but you've done testing, you've confirmed that your website works for people with disabilities. Um, so you've got that as a defense. Um, interesting legislation sort of introduced more of a concept of making sure you include people. So the, the Air Carrier Act, and I'll get Tanner to talk about this a little bit, specifically talked about making sure that you use people from the disability community in verifying that your website is accessible, which is different than most other laws. Maybe Tanner, you could give a little bit of background on that. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the things that really kind of expedited and, you know, really moved forward the focus and importance of usability and accessibility, really outlining specific guidelines of achievement for what would constitute as something that would be compliant. And so I like to, to use a, a physical accessibility analogy where, you know, if someone cannot get into the building, right, they can't get into the front door, maybe they can't use the restroom, whatever that physical inaccessibility is, the, the Air Carrier Act really brought that to the digital experience with regards to, um, fr from the end-to-end -end journey. So that includes the, uh, the moment from you know, scheduling transportation, booking that transportation, the entire engagement online, as well as to the moment where they're interfacing with your team um, at the airport and getting onto the airplane and off the airplane. It's a, it's a, it was a truly comprehensive approach that really uh, improved the industry. 
an, another uh, an, another item that came out of the Air Carrier Act, which I felt very very useful for people who are thinking about well, what testing do we need to do and how much testing we should do, is the Air Carrier Act uh, made it very clear about the priority of certain use cases on on airline websites. They listed out actually seven um, priority areas, so it, it became a lot more focused or easy to prioritize efforts because actually. If you take that into other areas like retail or travel, um, you know, or or banking, you can start thinking about your top five, top six use cases, and that's really what you want to be testing for. So, um, you know, these these are all aspects of reasons why the demand is there, and what we want to talk about is how do you actually uh, get those people practically set up and working um, to test your site. So, let's talk about a typical project. Um, and I'm going to bring Joe in here because he has a lot of a lot of experience. Firstly, just to be clear, the vast majority of companies that are really attacking this right now have been nudged, I will say, um, that way by uh, by lawsuits. Um, you know, the amount of people that call us up as a, 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 a proactively to find solutions for accessibility do match up with. The, the types of companies that are being sued for ADA. Um, they're also very um, uh, relevant uh, activities for people in general. So retail, food, food service, entertainment. I wanted to get Joe to talk about what the typical five use cases that you, you would be sort of brought in to test in a retail situation. Could you talk about that a little bit, Joe? Um, so t typically on a, uh, on a on a on a retail site, some sort of e-commerce site, um, we would look at uh, the, the the most you know the, the 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 high percentage things that a typical customer is going to use. So we're going to do a search for a product. Um, we're then going to look at uh, the results of that search on a on a product listing page and and to to verify that that page is fully accessible. Um, we'll go through a, a, a checkout process. So we'll, you know, we'll go to a product description page. We'll add an item to a cart, um, and we'll go through the checkout process. Um, we will look at just contacting uh, a, a retailer if there's if you have any sort of uh, issues with with a purchase. You're going to have to get engaged with customer support. So we'll typically look at. At, uh, if there's some sort of form to fill out or uh, how to access that information to, to reach it out to the retailer. So those are some typical uh, engagements that we will look at as far as uh, a, a website in a retail space. But it's, it's really, I think, very clarifying for people thinking about how to involve people with disabilities in testing. And I want to be clear here. We're, we actually advocate for involving people with, from the disability community in your accessibility strategy and your testing. You might hear things like user testing from people with disabilities, uh, disability communities. It's not traditional user testing. It's not testing where you provide the product without any sort of general feedback and hope people achieve something. What we typically are focused on um, with clients, and also, uh, you know, I want Joe and Tanner to talk about the, the 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 value of these types of testing, is we typically focus on helping customers verify that the i the the top user goals can be completed, the top user tasks can be completed by somebody using a particular assistive technology, and we'll get into like which ones you should test with in a second, but really, I want to talk about that, which is. Maybe uh, uh, um, uh, Tanner, you could just give us a, a feeling of like, uh, you know, how you how you would set up testing, which is really about task completion as opposed to quote unquote user feedback uh, as the as the primary, not the only, but let's say as the primary goal. Yeah, great, great question. I, I think that no one in their right mind would uh, publish or push live a product, a website, a mobile app without ensuring that someone can actually use it first. We're not gonna roll the dice and just wish for the best. Right? We're going to 
test the product. We're going to test the asset and make sure that people can actually use it as intended, designed, and, and built and developed. So the same thing is true with people with disabilities in users. We want to ensure that they can complete the task. Joe did a great description and outline of what that might look like in the retail space. The same thing is true uh, with, air, uh, with travel and hospitality. So we want to make sure that end users across categories, across disability categories, can use the product, can use the digital asset as designed. And you know, to Jason's point, that's task completion. Um, and the user feedback will go beyond that, but really starting with that task completion, just making sure that we can get to the end goal is critical. And one point I think we want to make here is that the ideal world is that you see a person, a user who uses an assistive technology as a persona extension to your current testing philosophy, not a separate group of people that you want to deal with later on after you've like built the most perfect website and now you're like, oh, we better make sure that website works for people with disabilities. If, if an organization has a testing structure which includes task completion verification whether particular users can can achieve certain goals feedback mechanisms to give feedback on that what you should be doing uh, is adding a persona in that user testing world or in that in that process where you've got a persona of certain types of user types you add a persona that is someone using an assistive technology and, and but, you know, we will talk about the range of assistive technologies you could test with. But if you if you're sort of uh, you know, if you're restrictive, we typically recommend someone with a screen reader, um, someone who is blind. Um, and I wanted to maybe um, Joe, you could maybe talk to us about why you feel and 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 why we feel in general as an as, as a group probably why testing with someone with a screen reader is sort of your best bang for your buck in terms of getting the the the, the best understanding of how accessible a, a, a website or an app is well I, I think for one thing um, I mean screen readers are are, are, are complex um, they uh, you know they, they interact with different browsers different ways so uh, you know what what works in Internet Explorer. You know it, the, the screen reader behaves a little bit differently in Chrome. So you you, you get a, a feel for um, uh, a lot of different scenarios with with a screen reader user. As far as some of that, I also think screen reader uh, users um, can address some other disabilities sometimes. Um, uh, people with uh, mobility issues, um, some use uh, different types of keyboards. We address a lot of keyboard issues uh, within screen reader usage. Uh, typically, a lot of times in my comments, uh, when I'm making a report uh, to a client, um, if there are keyboard issues that, are, that arise, I will even add stuff that I feel is relevant to someone that might have a mobility issue. Great. Yeah, I, I just really want to emphasize that, you know, and, uh, and actually, I'm, I'm actually showing a screen right now and I talk, I talk through the screen, uh, obviously, for Tanner and, uh, and for Joe's uh, sake as well. Screen readers are not separate things from how you use your website. So a typical user would, there's a website which has web code or there's a, na a native app and then there's a web browser. A screen reader allows Joe to control the web browser. Um, it's not a separate application itself that talks to the website. There is exactly the same structure as everyone else's uh, operation. So it's important to understand that web code, so when you, when you develop web code to the WCAG standards, what that allows the website to do is expose itself, so expose its navigation, expose other elements. Um, to an accessibility tree. Essentially, that means that the web browser can then um, understand or 
provide the mechanism for you to navigate around that website. And then a screen reader allows Joe to control the web browser. So when you start thinking about um, testing, and we're going to go into sort of like how, uh, wh what to test with, the understanding that you build a website to the standard, you test with particular web browsers, and then you add a screen reader. Uh, and that's going to be important in a second. I think people are going to understand maybe uh, where sometimes uh, when people are testing with screen reader users, um, they can create uh, a range of problems which aren't necessarily the ones that they're trying to actually do, uncover. So maybe we could go, Bethany, to the next slide and, uh, and we'll talk about those like technologies to test with. So, and maybe I'll get Joe to talk a little bit about this, but um, what, I, what I'm presenting here is, well, if we're going to test people using assistive technology, what is the combination? What's the combination we should be testing with? So there's maybe two, two questions. One is, what is the most likely combination of browser and screen reader or browser and assistive technology like Zoom that your users might use? There's a second layer, which is, if does that browser combination, is that a fully tested component on your original website? So I wanted to maybe first start with Tana. Um, what do you find is the most popular combination of um, browser and technology? But also, let's, in, let's also include Windows and, uh, and, um, and uh, iOS. Um, what it, what's, the, what's the most popular sort of combination that you find today? Yeah, and it, this is evolving and changing as um, different, um, uh, there's advancements in in the access and, and ability and, and capability of, of these assistive technologies. So we're seeing an emergence in NVDA, which is an open source free uh, screen reader. So NVDA and Firefox, is a huge one. JAWS and Chrome is another big one. Um, JAWS and Internet Explorer. And Joe was kind of hinting at earlier too is that, you know, I might be on uh, JAWS and Chrome and, you know, that user experience is going to be different with a, you know, a Windows 10 machine versus a Windows 7 machine. And so even this slide that Jason's showing right here that breaks down, um, everything from you know NVDA and Firefox to iOS and Safari is that uh, things are changing all the time and you know getting back to those um, uh, the, using this slide as a framework for how you should be testing is a great way to capture the largest case of, of users who are actually engaging with your assets. And Joe uh, maybe because you've got a, a broad experience right Do you, do you see a difference in terms of uh, the types of combinations being used maybe in like education and corporate as opposed to like what people use at home, like if, they, if they're not part of an organization? Um, well, for many, many, many years, um, Internet Explorer and JAWS was the go-to combination. Um, it was used by state agencies. It was used in the, edu in, you know, the area of education. Um, that was basically what we were um as 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 an instructor that's the combination that we were um doing instruction in um but that's evolving uh, more people are migrating over to google chrome now with jaws um part and parcel because microsoft is you know really pushing their edge browser now over internet explorer so people are migrating over to to a different browser and they're choosing chrome right now so that, this is always a very sort of um, complicated question for clients. So a client will typically say, okay, but there's lots of combinations. What should we test with? Um, and again, I think it's a two part question. Um, the first question I typically ask is, what browsers do you currently test with as part of your QA? Because you're really gonna wanna put a screen reader on top of whatever the browser is that you know works really well with the website to make sure that you're discovering screen reader issues, not new browser issues. That, that's probably the biggest item that I think, um, you know, people have struggled with in the past. You know, that 
they have a website it's great it works great on chrome and safari and they do user testing with someone with uh, with windows internet explorer and jaws and they start to find lots of problems um not because of this not because of the accessibility of the of the site and the screen reader but because the site has not been tested with internet explorer before so instantly someone could have problems achieving things not because of the screen reader but because of the browser underneath so it's one thing to re really sort of emphasize that you want to start with making this part of an extension of your current qa to minimize um the lab uh, the the efforts that might come in when you start to think about um uh, remediating and then you may want to make sure that you're uh, you're writing that very clearly in your support pages that that your support team know what uh, what's been tested on and you encourage people that maybe are using different combinations to report issues um but you will find that obviously you know uh websites today don't support certain browsers very well and if someone's using that browser with an assistive technology of course they're going to have problems as well so um you know you want to make sure you know what you've you've tested with and it's clear to everyone what you've tested with um, so um, new reported information um, you're collecting what their combination is so you can understand uh, whether it's a browser issue potentially or whether it's a screen reader issue um, point, so yeah. let's let's talk about um, skill sets like what type of skill sets do we look for so I'm actually going to first start with Joe because he's sort of um, on a daily basis, sort of working with testers, bringing testers on, you know, interviewing them, understanding the sort of testing that they want. Um, what do you look for, Joe, in, in a tester when you're sort of adding a tester to a team? Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, even before assistive technology uh, skills, it's people who use um, different websites and mobile applications on a regular basis. I think that's important. Do you use um, retail um, websites or retail applications? Do you use online banking? Do you use uh, travel uh, airlines? All those sort of things. I think that's important. Then then it's digging down and, and seeing what their skill set as far as assistive technology and, and their strengths are as far as that goes. And, and and assessing that, and you know, making sure that they have a a, a reasonably good skill set um, as far as being able to utilize, um, you know, if it's a screen reader user, can they use more than one um, one screen reader? Are they on multiple platforms? Are they, do they have the ability to use multiple platforms, et cetera? I think that those are some basic basic yeah, skills. I, I, I love that list. We, we have we have a list up as well, which basically matches that, just to, to give you an idea. But I think what Joe's really saying is, the list is the same list that you would typically ask for when you're recruiting, you know, uh, you know, technical testers. Anyway, it's detail orientated, ability to communicate, um, understanding the, the 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 type of industry that you're in, uh, familiarity with types of sites, screen reader is a tick box at the end not the tick box at the start if you if you know what i mean it's not oh this person uh is uses a screen reader great they must let's use them um you know they might only be familiar with using educational sites and they've never used a, a, a retail site before so it's important but you understand what you're looking for um and what skill sets you're looking for um and obviously the the ability to use a assisted technology on a regular basis is key um, if we can move Bethany to the next, I'm going to bring Tanner in here. Tanner, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, the different levels. I, I talk about like three levels of where you can find testers. So sort of like, you know, the from the very sort of affordable uh, area around, you know, sort of uh, uh, staff or friends of staff or community, like other types of companies that do like direct recruiting. And I, and I know uh, you know, we, we all know a few, maybe you can mention a couple of that, you know, placing people inside of companies to do testing is obviously a, a very important part of potentially like our engagement level. And then third party companies, um, you know, that uh, like yourselves, that can be hired, sort of how, how that structure works. Maybe you could give us a little, a little detail across those three. 
Yeah, certainly. And there, there's multiple ways to skin a cat, right? And so whether – I love what you're hinting at, Jason, with regards to how um, – robust and vast the uh, um, disability community is. You, you may never have met someone who's blind or visually impaired. I never did before I lost my sight. Um, and so asking around with your, with your team, with your product managers and, and engaging them to see, hey, do you guys know of anybody? That's a really low cost way to bring someone in who's a stakeholder in an outcome who wants to help your organization take their accessibility and usability to the next level. Really great way to get Oh, I think we just lost uh we just lost uh Tanner. Um Bethany, can you see if you can get Tanner back? That's uh Jason, that's a great point. So I, I think that there's a continuum, right, of usability and accessibility uh, testing opportunities. I think it's a really good idea for product managers and developers, your internal team. You may, you may never have met someone with blindness or visual impairment before. I, I never did before I lost my sight. But the, the blindness and visually impaired community is a little bit more robust than people might understand. And so ask your internal team, you know, do you happen to know of anybody that has blindness or visual impairment that might be interested in doing some testing. And that's a great low cost way to get a stakeholder who's invested in the outcome to help you take your accessibility and usability to the next level. So that's one way. Um, another great way is to actually source and, and market those candidates. Very similar case Right, someone who may not be a professional, but a stakeholder in the outcome. And so that's how we can get maybe a group of testers giving you guys feedback and insights on, on what the accessibility is across different types of environments, right? We had talked before about NVDA Firefox, JAWS and Chrome, JAWS and IE, et cetera. And then when you start to come up the continuum or advance down the continuum, you're going to get somebody like Joe. Right? Someone who's got a computer science background, someone who's this is their job. They know how to talk to developers. They can integrate side by side into the development process and give you that quick, immediate feedback that you need now because that's where you're at in the development cycle. Great. So there's, there's different levels. You know, we, we encourage everyone to sort of think about what, what where the level is, you know, but, you know, uh, for us, if you're, if it's a professional organization, you've got professional testers for other things, you should be looking to engage professional testers from the disability community, whether that's through someone like the ASB or Helen Keller Institute or ourselves, um, where, you know, we, we, we organize uh, the testing that to be done, we coordinate making sure we get the feedback in, we put it back into developer, developers we, we talk about the remediation that's going to that's going to solve the issues that are found um, but there's there's definitely a, a whole scale um, when it comes to uh, making sure you involve people um, with disabilities um, and let's sort of just end with the key takeaways and um, hopefully people have um, uh, uh, got their own little takeaways from what we said but I just want to uh, emphasize again um, you know what you want to do with user testing is set up goals very similar to how you would look at your website from a, these are the top five things people do on the website. We want to make sure that those top five things can be done by people with disabilities and get feedback on was it achieved? Was it achieved in a reasonable amount of time? Could the experience be improved? So really very specific sort of questions. Um, where you're really looking to understand achievement, but also get some feedback in terms of whether things can be improved for that particular assistive technology. Um, for us, um, you know, you want to include those people as early as possible. Again, as, uh, accessibility becomes affordable if you include it early rather than add it later. If you add it later, everything uh, becomes more expensive. So really get a persona inside of your testing environment where your user tester has a persona of using a particular assistive technology and, and integrate them at the same time as you do all other user testing um, along the process. Um, I, I think it's very important that people should be uh, considering now that um, native apps and how your website works on a mobile phone 
is as important than on a desktop. And I actually want uh, maybe uh, Joe to talk a little bit about this. How important is, a, is your mobile device now, Joe, compared to your desktop device when it comes to your personal use of, for example, retail or banking and other things? Give people an understanding of how important mobile is uh, to, the, to you as a, a blind user. Uh, for me, it's extremely important. I, I do probably most of my, pretty pretty much every area, uh, travel, my personal banking, uh, most of my retail purchases are, are done on a mobile device um, over a desktop. It, it's actually very rare that I, I do any sort of business in any of those areas on, on, a, on a desktop website. At, at this point in the game, and I, I think that's very prominent just across the board for the the, the blind community in general. And Tanner, is that is that similar in your experience uh, um, with regards to the, the importance of uh, mobile? Couldn't agree more. I'm engaging in this conversation through my mobile device right now, whether it's YouTube or social or email or banking or travel, uh, retail. If I'm on Amazon, probably on my phone. And it, it is, you'd be short, it's short sighted to think that people with disabilities are only on desktop. Yeah, and I think it's a, uh, I mean, I'll just add that our, our knowledge is that 20% uh, of lawsuits now uh, are aimed at, uh, are aimed at um, lawsuits around the use of mobile, not just native apps, but actually. Um, uh, claiming that websites uh, have not been designed properly for browsing on a mobile device. Um, it is logical that um, not just lawsuits, but other types of claims, uh, uh, feedback that you're going to get um, is going to be about people trying to use assistive technology on mobile devices because it's what the disability community have in their hand, just like everybody else in the world, 95% uh, of the time. So. Um, if you feel that as an organization that mobile is as important, if not more important than your website from a long-term strategic point of view, then it's important that you add accessibility to those uh, priorities as well, because it's not about avoiding a, a website lawsuit. It's about providing accessibility to digital presence. So I think that's our, Jason, sort of our closing if, thing. Oh, Tana, please go. If, yeah, I just wanted to to drive to help drive that home just a little bit more. You know, the advancements in technology today are just incredible, and there are there are teams across the world who are working day and night to make sure that people with disabilities can engage with this digital world that we find ourselves. So please do not lose sight of the fact that people with disabilities right now, across mobile and desktop, are trying to engage with you and your business. Great. So um, uh, this is actually time for questions. Uh, we're uh, live on this session uh, via our YouTube account. So um, we're open and available for you guys to ask questions from now. Bethany, did you have any uh, closing statements before we go to that? Yes, I just wanted to thank um, our presenters and say um, if you're interested in speaking with our panelists, directly. I've posted up everyone's email address on this slide, um, as well as my own, and we'd love to hear from you. At UsableNet, we've written about this and related topics um, in detail in the past, and if you'd like to re receive some of those supporting resources, um, I've created a, a web page for that. It's up here. Um, you can just go and sign up. It's exclusive to a future date attendees, and it just allows us to send you some related materials to today's uh, topic. Um, so that is available there. And we appreciate everyone's time today. And that concludes the panel discussion. Thank you so much for joining us on our final day of A Future Date. We hope you learned something new and valuable today. Thank you again to all the volunteers who helped organize, the speakers for your knowledge, 3Play Media for captioning, and Basecamp for their project management tool. I also wanted to give a special shout out to Matt May, who came up with the idea for this conference and who has been working tirelessly for the last few months to make this event happen. Finally, thank you for tuning in. 
It has been incredible to see active participants from all over the world during this impromptu virtual event. As a reminder, individual talks will be posted on the A Future Date YouTube channel, and links to available videos and slide decks will be shared on our website soon. If you didn't get enough of A Future Date, we have links to merchandise with cool shirts and stickers on our website. Proceeds will be donated to a COVID and disabilities related charity. I hope you had a great day. Thanks so much for joining us.